for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. How you doing? Hi, yeah. Fade to black. Bespoke radio for the masses. Today's Wednesday, September 16th. Two hundred and fifty-nine days of the new year, one hundred and six days left. We are live from the City of Angel Studios, right here in rainy Burbank, California. COA Vapor, makers of the Fader Black E Juice. It is called Fader Loops. Everybody's vaping today. Yours truly included. Go to the COA banner, JimmyChurchRadio.com. You can use the promo code Jimmy. For the Vader Not Special. It's free shipping. Everybody's vaping. I'd like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States, hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black. For KJCR and the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the planet. I'm your oh-so-humble host, Jimmy Church, and tonight, we have very special guest back with us, Scott Walter. We have a lot to discuss tonight. As you know, the Scott's last two trips through uh, Fade to Black and Coast to Coast, he left us hanging. And tonight, we're going to go through all of those unanswered questions tonight. And his new show that premiered over this past weekend, Pirate Treasure of the Knights Templar. Episodes one and two premiered over the weekend, and they were spellbinding. I I was absolutely glued to it. And near the end of the second episode, at around midnight, I got a hold of Scott. I said, man, man, man. And he said, absolutely, let's do this. So he is back with us tonight. Very excited to have Scott on the show. Always a good conversation. And uh, we'll see if we can also take some phone calls a little bit later on. 323-825-5045. You can also Skype in Fade to Black and the number 14. All right. Let's get the show cracking. Let's get some announcements out of the way. We are getting close to the MUFON Symposium. And uh, which is next week, also next week, next Friday, before the symposium, I'll be hosting Coast to Coast AM. I'll be sitting in for George Norrie. And uh, so uh, and uh, my guest uh, next Friday night will be Richard Dolan. And then we will have open lines all night. Uh, you know, the, the Friday night show for Coast to Coast. That's what we do. And that's what I'll be doing. And I would love for some fader knots to break through on the lines. And uh, that would be really, really cool. So uh, come hang out with Sir Richard Bleepin' Dolan and myself next Friday night. And then the next night, I'll be down at the MUFON Symposium uh, down at uh, the Hotel Irvine in Irvine, California. The symposium itself is going down the 25th through the 27th. And uh, obviously, Friday night, I'll be at Coast. I won't be down at the symposium. We had a change of plans, obviously. But nonetheless, 
Saturday night, I'll be down at the MUFON Symposium. So uh, come down and hang out there. So you get to hang out on Coast to Coast Friday night, and then then come down and hang out at uh, at the symposium. It's going to be great. And, uh, you know, Paul Hellyer is going to be speaking. He'll be speaking Friday night. Cheryl Jones is going to be there. Mark D'Antonio. Uh, Mike Bear is going to be there. And Melissa Tittle and uh, Ben Moss and John Ventry and Lee Spiegel and the crew from uh, Hangar One. The producers of Hangar One will be there, too, as well. Uh, and I think I, I think we're going to get lucky, man. Maybe even some some camera people and, and the crew and the, and the production side of things and the sound guy and all of that, uh, uh, you know, everybody's going to be there. We're going to have about uh, 20 or 25 people from uh, Hangar One there. List is too long to sit here and name every single one tonight, but they're all listed over at the MUFON website. So just go over to MUFON.com, click on Symposium. Tickets and information are there. Looking forward to it. All right. And uh, so there you go. Last night, uh, oh, I do want to mention uh, the Fade to Blog. I, I, I've i spent the last two days uh, reading uh, Fade to Blog. I am so impressed, flattered, humbled, so impressed with what is going on on Fade to Blog. And if you are listening to the show right now for the first time, you've never read Fade to Blog, uh, we launched it uh, last week. So th these are some of the best writers out there, and they happen to be fader knots too, as well. Well, most of them. And go and it is extraordinary insights and pros. I am so proud of what is going on on Fade to Blog. You need to go to jimmychurchradio.com, click on Fade to Blog, and get your read on. Absolutely. I am so, uh, I just, I, I'm just. It's just uh, warm and fuzzy isn't even the right feeling that I have when I read. I am just proud, so proud. Fade to blog. That's where you need to start off your show or your day, your show, your day, every day. Go to, go to fade to blog and then go to the news page. And then, you know, it's funny. Go to the news page. You know what I'm going to be reading in, in, uh, for the, the night show. All the news that you know nothing about. But uh, fade to blog. If you want to write for us. And you're good. And you want to write for us, send an email to Rita, Rita at JimmyChurchRadio.com, and we'll get the audition process going. I reported on a story yesterday about uh, the vehicle to vehicle, the V2V, and the vehicle to infrastructure, V2I communication. And after the show, it kept me up all night long. I, I laid in bed with my eyes open, thinking about what this actually means. And I have to just go back, and I just want to briefly address it, because uh, what, what, what this means to us is frightening. There are positive things about it, but they, the, the, the bad side of it just so far outweighs the good stuff. And I, and I understand the good stuff. I do, but the implications of our right to privacy is frightening. Think about that for a second, because once that communication happens and they know what car they're communicating with and the VIN number and, and, the, and the software that is on the car, then that means they know about you, your address. And this is the days of the internet. So that means they know where you live and they know where you work and they know about your taxes and they know about your, your Facebook postings, whatever. They just want to bang out and, and find out everything about this car that just sped by a sign, took an illegal right-hand turn on a red light, a rolling California stop, boom, pulls up and just right there. Who is this? Who is this person in this car? The scanning of cars and personal information and owner information, driving habits. How about that? Think about that. What, what, where, where could this go? You know, you skip out on work one day and you're at the golf course. 
could that information get out? And, and, and you went to whatever, you know, you went to a competitor's store from your employer, whatever, just, 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 it could be anything. Maybe you went on another job interview. Maybe you're a government employee and you went in a government car and took a little detour and, and, and did something else outside of your job that doesn't harm anybody, whatever, nobody cares. But suddenly your boss gets notified and says, hey, dude, what were you doing over here? You were supposed to be working. Well, I took a little break. Now you think about this for a second. It is, it's disturbing. And, 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 and the doors that it opens, it closes other ones really, really bad. We need to really, at this point, before this gets out of control, I understand the technology and I know it's easy to implement. You know, it's just little teeny tiny packets of data, just little, little blips of information that leads to everything. Think about that for a second. You know what I mean? What? It just, what if? You owe the IRS a little little bit of change, a little dosh, and you zip past a sign. Bop, 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 bop. There he is. Really? Think about that for a second. It's crazy, isn't it? Just think about it. And it's not about unpaid parking tickets. It's everything about you immediately, immediately. It doesn't take much. We need to really think about that. I thought about that last night and my eyes, I couldn't, I lost sleep. This needs to stop before it gets started, man. All right. I just, I, you know, I, I just had to do that. There was just... Uh, an earthquake down in Chile, uh, 8.3 magnitude, 8.4 uh, here on the radio uh, here in Los Angeles. I heard it was downgraded to 7.2, then back up to 7.4, 7.5, now 8.2, 8.3. I don't know. Tsunami warnings. I, I've, I've heard about this uh, not only for Hawaii, but the California coast. Uh, I, I've seen all of it. Uh, the point is we need to think about the people down in Chile. And uh, who have just absolutely, their experience with earthquakes is uh, uh, second to none on planet Earth. It surpasses California, no doubt. And our thoughts are with them down there. And I'm hoping it's just not as crazy as it sounds. Because when you hear, here in Southern California, and we know what a Richter scale is, man. And we hear... You know, 6.9, 4.9, ah, no big deal, 5.1, whatever. You know, you start to hear 7, 7, 1, 7, 4, 8, 2, 8, 3, 8, 4. That's some bad news. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Scott Walter is with us. Follow him on Twitter, Real Scott Walter. Follow us on Twitter, at J Church Radio. Scott Walter is with us. When I come back, all the news that you know nothing about. I'm KGRA, The Planet. I'll be back right after this. Stay with us. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. What's up, revolutionaries? It's me, Jimmy Church. Do you have an IRS or state tax issue? Well, I did, and I called national tax experts. My problems were fixed, done, fini, and man, I gotta tell you, it was a relief. National tax experts are a recognized tax office that services clients in all 50 states. It doesn't matter where you live. Give them a call. I'm telling you, they take the time to understand each and every client's individual financial status as well as their financial goals. 
And that's exactly what you need, my brother, when you're taking on the evil three letter. So, seriously, give them a call today at 1 877 909 5444. Again, 1 877 909 5444. Or go check out their website, dub 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 nattaxexperts.com. That's N A T T A X E X P E R T S dot com. Tell them Jimmy sent you. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. Hi, this is Chase Kletsky with Fate Magazine Radio, and you're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA digital broadcast station, where the Fader Knots rock. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back, Fade to Black. The word of the day, of the week, of the month, is spoon. Uh, love saying that. Welcome back. Let's get this show cracking. Got a lot to do. Today, actor Mickey Rourke is 63 years old. Route 66. Buffalo 66. Amy Poehler today is 44. Richard Marks is 52. Remember Richard Marks? Our dead guy's birthday today is B.B. King. Moment of silence, please. 1925 to 2015, died at the age of 89. Man, 15 Grammy Awards out of 24 nominations. Two of his daughters alleged that King was deliberately poisoned. And then they had an autopsy. King's... King's body uh, was uh, autopsied. Las Vegas Met Police were involved. Autopsy revealed that King's death of complications of Alzheimer's disease and congestive heart failure with no evidence of poisoning. Uh, it was just uh, not the way to uh, treat the king after his uh, death. Anyway, B.B. King, happy birthday. King of the blues guitar. Influenced everybody. The thrill is gone. Lucille. Ah, yes. All right. On this day in history in 1620, the Mayflower departed England. That's right. Mayflower sailed out of Plymouth, bound for the New World with 102 first-class passengers. Fader facts. Got a few. Time zone fader facts. Despite being a large country, all of China follows a single time zone in Beijing time. That's right. So some areas experience sunset at midnight during the summer. At the North Pole, research stations follow the different time zones of their respective countries. That's pretty trippy. And the ISS follows Greenwich Mean Time, GMT. And a Swedish company has invented a time zone for future colonies on the moon. It's called LST. Lunar Standard Time, which begs to ask the question, what is Martian time? Anybody got anything on that? Tweet it. Love to know. What is Martian time? All of the news that you know nothing about. Yes, uh, a federal district court has ordered the FBI to lift a surveillance gag order that was imposed on a businessman under the Patriot Act. Nicholas Merrill spent 11 years challenging its constitutionality. And the case concerns the FBI sending an, an NS national security letter, an NSL, to Merrill, who ran an Internet service company which requested access to his customers' records. Under the Patriot Act, the recipient of the NSL is prohibited from mentioning the letter, the contents of the letter, and what it seeks because of the possible threat to an investigation. In Merrill's case, the gag order was imposed by the FBI in 2004. 
The court's latest ruling agreed with Merrill that the government had violated its constitutional rights and marked the first time that a gag order has been lifted since the Patriot Act vastly expanded the FBI's authority for warrantless spying back in 2001. Hallelujah. All right. I got a comment on this. You know, Muslim teen Ahmed Muhammad creates a clock, goes to school, shows teachers, and gets arrested. That's right. <laughs> Irving police spokesman officer James McClellan told the station uh, over in, in, in Irving, uh, Dallas, Texas, he said, and I'm quoting here, we attempted to question the juvenile about what it was, and he would simply only tell us that it was a clock. Well, what did you expect? The teenager did that because, well, it was a clock. <laughs> what would you want him to say? On Wednesday, today, earlier, police announced that the team will not be charged. Of course he's not. Chief Larry Boyd said that Ahmed should have been forthcoming by going beyond the description that what he made was a clock. What do you mean? It was a clock. Going on what? Beyond what description? What did you want him to say? Did you want him to use the word bomb so you could arrest him? Dude said it was a clock because it was a clock. And now Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg has joined Barack Obama, NASA, MIT, showing support and extending invitations to meet to meet the kid. I hope he gets a I hope he gets a, a scholarship out of this. I hope he goes to MIT and I hope he's he's all of that. He's bright and listening to him speak, it, it, it's just so impressive. What are you doing? And I'll say this, and I'm going to say this now. Had he been a white kid, would we be having this problem? Had he been a girl, a little girl in school bringing this clock to school, would there have been a problem? The problem is because he's Muslim. And, man, that is wrong. Absolutely wrong. I don't care what. It's, it's, ah. The whole thing just spelt, man, you know what? Sue the crap out of him. Took you out of school in handcuffs because you said it was a clock. And you didn't want to admit that it was something. It's just, ugh. police department should be ashamed. The teacher should be ashamed. Ashamed. Apologies forthcoming. Settle out of court, send them to school. That's it. Man, I'm just embarrassed for this country sometimes. All right. Eight Mexican tourists. Now, you probably haven't heard about this. Now, check this out. Eight Mexican tourists and four Egyptian nationals were killed in a military airstrike. Two missiles hit four vehicles. I've seen the leaked footage of the scene, and it's insane. But guess what? They were tourists from Mexico. In Western Egypt, looking at cool stuff, the Egyptian government claims the military mistook the tourists for terrorists and blames the tour operator for not having the right permits or notifying them of their presence in a restricted zone. But, as it turns out, they had an official Egyptian police officer with them on the tour. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. The the video is just it's 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 horrific. It's beyond words. It's just beyond words. There is now a dating app for bacon lovers, by the way. Had to do this. I'll end on a on an up note and an upswing. There's a bacon app, a dating app for bacon lovers. With survey questions like, what kind of bacon do you love most? Me, I'm, you know, I'm a maple bacon guy. What type of bacon do you prefer? You know, turkey bacon, pork, pork belly. If a friend tried to serve you a bacon flavored piece of bacon with, with liquid sodium, what would you do? <laughs> that's, on, that's a survey question. Yes. 
How do you like your bacon cooked? Chewy, crispy, burnt. These are questions. If you're on a date and there's one strip of bacon left, you would. It's a question on the survey. The app uses GPS to find other app users locally or nationwide. Similar, It's similar to the way Tinder uh, works. Users like photos, and if both like each other's profiles, they are directed to a messaging platform where they can get to know one another. Bacon dating app. I, you know, I feel kind of in, in a weird way. I feel that all of you, fade or not, are responsible for this bacon trend. It would, you remember when it, it all kicked off a couple of years ago? It was a Saturday night. We were uploading uh, videos uh, to YouTube. We were in the studio working late. And I somehow got into a chat with all of you fade or nots. I can't remember where it was. What, what was, was it in Twitter? Might have been in Twitter. And, and the word bacon rolled out. And we never looked back. And it was way before all of this bacon beer, bacon incense, bacon cupcakes, <laughs> bacon, bacon, bacon. Don't you feel a little guilty and responsible for this? Every time you hear the word bacon now. Yes, Tammy, pork belly is bacon. That's what uh, that's that's why I said it. You know what I'm saying? That's why I said it, Tammy. Um, but do do you guys feel guilty? Yeah, it was Twitter. Allison said it says it was Twitter. Did, <laughs> don't you feel a little strange, a little responsible for this madness that uh, is rolling across <laughs> Dew Sky? Go, go, baconly tasty. I love you guys. This is fade to black. All right, let's get out of here. I got so much more to talk about tonight. We'll uh, we'll tie that up the loose ends at the end of the show. Let's get out of here. Let's get Scott Walter in here. Scott Walter. Lots to talk about tonight. His new show just premiered over the weekend, and it is called Pirate Treasure of the Knights Templar. We got that, but we have we have everything else about Scott. You know, he's a dynamic guy, man of the world. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black, the spoke radio for the masses on the Game Changer Network. And KGRA, the planet tonight, Scott Walter. Tomorrow night, Fader Night. I'll be back right after this. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network. At KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. Hello, I'm Katini, and you're listening to my main man, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hi, this is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Today, everybody, the Fader Knots and Planet Earth is vaping. And I'm very proud to announce our very own e juice. When we were approached by City of Angels Vapor about Fade to Black e juice, I wanted to make sure that it was the very best and that the flavors were something that I could create myself. And we did just that. Introducing Fade to Black Fader Loops. This will take you right back to Saturday morning cartoons and your favorite bowl of fruity, loopy cereal. Just click on the banner or go to www.coavapor.com. Enter the promo code Jimmy for the Fader Not Special. That's www.coavapor.com. Go back, Lee Tappy. Hi, this is Ray Sobs here repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church. Fade to black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. Imagine no longer being tied down to your computer, but having the freedom to take live talk radio with you anywhere you go. TalkStream Live introduces our first ever iPhone application. The talk shows you follow now follow you. And your iPhone is now the fastest and easiest way to stay connected to the best talk radio on the Internet. Let TalkStream Live transform the way you listen to radio. Listen to live talk shows 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Mobile talk radio from TalkStream Live. Now available in the iTunes App Store.
This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're of the Honey Brothers. <laughs> We're of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. Attention all fade or not. Studio Dome has a special deal on their SD1 Bluetooth speaker. Just go to JimmyChurchRadio.com, click on their banner, enter the promo code Jimmy, and you get $40 off and free shipping on the SD-1. It's voice activated. Comes with a USB antenna, cables, and a carry bag. Never listen to your phone, tablet, or laptop speakers ever again. It's the only way to listen to Fade to Black. That's JimmyChurchRadio.com, Studio Dome banner, promo code Jimmy. Go back, Lee Tappy. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. Across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, The Planet. <laughs> Welcome back. Fade to Black, bespoke radio for the masses. Tonight, Scott Walter is with us. I'm so used to saying of America Unearthed, but now we've got his new show. Pirate Treasure of the Knights Templar premiered this past weekend, uh, episodes one and two. And we're going to talk about that. Lots of other stuff tonight. Uh, tomorrow night is a fader night. And so we're going to mix it up tomorrow night. Open lines, uh, uh, rock and roll trivia with uh, some other stuff that we're going to be talking about tomorrow night. And uh, it's going to be great. We will set the tone tomorrow. So there you go. Open lines tomorrow night. Scott Walter. He is a forcenic geologist. He is the host of History Channel's America Unearthed and now Pirate Treasure of the Knights Templar. Uh, Scott is also, also the author of several books, including the Kensington Runestone, Compelling New Evidence, and the Hooked X, the Key to the Secret History of North America. Scott has been president of American Petrographic Services, Inc. since 1990 and has been the principal petro- <laughs> petrographer in more than 7,000 investigations throughout the world, including the evaluation of fire damage concrete at the Pentagon following the attacks of September 11th, 2001. In 2005, he co-authored the Kensington Runestone, Compelling New Evidence. His new series is Pirate Treasure of the Knights Templar, premiered on History Channel this past weekend. I would like to welcome back to the program, Mr. Scott Walter. Good evening, Scott. How are you, man? I'm good, Jimmy. How are you? Looks like uh, you got a a good crowd there on Twitter. I'm I'm excited. Uh, man, that's pretty insane what happens on Twitter every night, isn't it? <laughs> they love you, man. They love their Scott Walter. Well, they're they're a good group out there, and I appreciate uh, appreciate all the comments. It's you, great. You know, it, you know what's well, you know what's great about it, <laughs> Scott, and and this is no joke. That that whole Twitter thing, the sandbox, all of that. That was done by them, you know, and you can't create something like that. It has to be organic. It has to just, you know, occur on its own. They set the rules. I just kick back and and watch it. And it is it's a truly humbling experience every single night. It's so organic. That's great. Well, you're doing something right for them to. uh to get in that sandbox and keep it rolling. So whatever you're doing, keep it keep it going. Well, you know what, though? It goes right back at you. It's what you're doing. It, you know what? If they didn't like you, Scott, you get tossed out of the sandbox, you and your bucket <laughs> and, your, and, <laughs> and your shovel. Yeah, and trust me, it has happened, too, in the past. But, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's just an organic thing. It's so cool. And now, uh, thank you, by the way, for uh, uh, coming back on the show. And what was really funny... And uh, and I know I said this on the uh, on the air, but I need you to back me up on this. I uh, I truly contacted you at midnight, which was three in the morning or two in the morning your time, uh, dude. You you know we we've got to do this, and you immediately hit me back, and <laughs> and you didn't think twice about it. So just thank you for that, and and no problem. Yeah, we uh, we bumped somebody tonight uh, to get you on. 
And, what? Uh, well, only because we, hey, look, it, it, it's okay. It's okay. But the point is, I wanted to strike while the iron was hot on, on so many different subjects. One, uh, the show that the, you, you premiered two <clears throat> episodes back to back. And I was floored about not only the show and what it was about, but the fact that it, you are um, uh, you are talking about real things. Real things are happening on the show. I feel it. It's 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 not done. It's not popcorn. It's not you know. It's not bubblegum stuff. This is real things happening in real time. It was that right. was that your decision? Was that the network? You know, how did that come about? Because it seems very, very hard-hitting and straightforward. Well, it it wasn't really anybody's plan. And and to be honest with you, this whole story that's going to unfold over the next couple weeks um, unfolded over about six months. And my my role originally was just going to be somebody to come on and just talk briefly about some of the artifacts that Barry and his crew were pulling off the shipwrecks in Madagascar. And, you know, I was just going to just be a, a guest appearance. And, and because of all the things that happened, my role increased. And, and part of it was due to the fact that Barry's crew had a hard time getting their permits to dive. And that's why they were finding so many things on the beach. And, and you know, then they wanted me to do a bunch of other things. And it just all sort of just came together. And then, as you saw at the end of the second episode, he found that uh, that big metal bar and all of a sudden things went in a totally different direction and it's like it's like they just put it in overdrive and and you'll see what happens over the next next few episodes but I mean it was it was nuts and we had to reshoot a bunch of things because the story kept changing so it definitely was organic and we just we just went with the flow uh, let's let's stay on the show for a second. That wasn't my plan, but you and I just talk. So there you go. So <laughs> um, it, it, a couple of things struck me on the show, and I want to lead up to the silver bar. But uh, right. but I'm going to end. Uh, my next question is where you just ended right there. So you're saying that over the next couple of episodes, action, like we're going to see real things happen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everything was. Everything was real. I mean, we. Um, well, you know we what? Just... I'm going to cut you off. All right, uh, go ahead. As opposed to other shows, Scott, where you know the ending. Okay, so you. No, saying... no, no, no. Wait a minute. Now, well, hold on a sec. Let me let me put it to you this way. If you're talking about America on Earth, no, no, um, no, 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 no. I'm talking. Oh, about... okay, okay. Because I was going to say that's that's not the way it goes. I mean, sometimes we have a plan of of how we want to film something and how we think it's going to go. But you know how it is. Then then when you actually do it, stuff happens and you go in a different direction and you have to follow follow the evidence or you follow the action or you follow what doesn't happen sometimes. And even though we like to think we know what's going to happen, a lot of times we're just as surprised with the outcome as, as the audience. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the, no, what I was referring to, Scott, is when you have a show that deals with uh, uh, so many, it, it could be anything. Go back to uh, uh, Al Capone's vault. You know nothing was going to be in that vault. You know what I mean? It. You know, <laughs> because otherwise you would hear about it. And, yeah, but I watched the show. I was hoping. And, yeah, so I, I you know what? I, I, I tell you what, I'll defend those guys on that. I really do think that they thought there might be something there. But the the biggest issue looking back now that I'm, you know, I mean, God, I was a young guy back when they when that show was on. But but I think that they they got themselves all spun up on the story and they started believing all of what really at the end of the day was just speculation. Right. And they really didn't have anything tangible to lead them down this road that they were going to find something amazing. They just got themselves worked up. And unfortunately, they got whacked by it. And, you know, it, it's it's something everybody remembers, but probably for the wrong reasons. Now, uh, and back to the show, Barry literally is tripping over stuff on the beach. And yes. that, yeah. I mean, I, I sat up and... Uh, I, I think that his reactions, uh, and his, he he knows what he's looking for, and that's what's really cool. But uh, oh yeah, and, and but 
just to, it, it, truly tripping over objects on the beach. Uh, is that really what was going on in Madagascar? Could you really just comb the beach and look down and 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 find something you know ancient like that? Well, yeah. I mean, the answer is absolutely. I mean, you have to remember in that particular spot um, in Pirate Bay, which is over on the north side, that you know, it, there's two causeways there now. But back, you know, back in in Captain Kidd's day and the rest of those pirates' day around circa 1700, those causeways obviously weren't there, and those were little barrier islands. And so when they scuttled ships, they would go around to that north side, and they would dump their ships over there. So there was a bunch of stuff that was piled up, and and they would beach the ships, set them on fire, and then just collect the metal and anything of value. But a lot of the artifacts that they're finding, like the ceramic, you know, pieces and, uh, you know, different things that they find, you know, to some people, it doesn't mean much. Certainly back in 1700, those pirates didn't care about broken ceramics. Big deal. They just threw it in the water, left it on the beach, or they didn't care about it. So 300 years had to go by until suddenly that trash became treasure. And, you know, you saw the symbols on them. I mean, they're finding lots of stuff but we're making a big deal out of the things that are connected to what we think is going to tell us about who the people were that were on those ships and who scuttled them and what was going on in Pirate Bay. Uh, what did you think the the first time, uh, I know it comes across in the show somewhat, but the first time that you uh, had looked at uh, the, uh, the Jesus figure from the cross, uh, what was the first thing that popped into your mind when you saw it? Well, you know, when I, when I, uh, what, what you don't see in the show is that it wasn't just that Christ figure that I saw when I met Barry that first time. And that was the first time I ever met Barry. And in that meeting you saw, that was the first time I shook his hand. But he showed me some other artifacts that you don't, you're not going to hear about in the show, but they're religious figures that are similar, but not the same. The Christ figure, uh, the ivory Christ figure was was unique to say the least, and and it will um, play an even more significant role as we go along. So hang in there with it. But when I first saw it, I I I, I didn't know what to think. I mean, it was a religious figure, and it was you know it appeared to be Jesus Christ, and um, you know that could be a lot of people. It's not necessarily a Knights Templar artifact, but because. We know that the Templars were in this area of Madagascar. They, they almost certainly were in Pirate Bay. They certain, it certainly could have been related to them, and that was the question he wanted me to try to answer. When you went to Jerusalem, uh, you, uh, you went to the Dome of the Rock. Yep. I, 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 just, I want you to share that experience because, first off, you're about as white as anybody that could possibly be walking around <laughs> Jerusalem. Uh, Wait a minute! What are you talking about? Uh, <laughs> no, yeah, I, I'm about as yeah, I'm about as white guy as it gets. That's yeah, for sure. <laughs> yes, you are. And so, uh, and and you know, it's it's the elephant in the room. I mean, let's not ignore this fact. And yeah. and and so there you are. Uh, and and in the show, you're walking around uh, parts of Jerusalem, and you see the security forces there. You know, it's a oh, tense yeah. region and everything. And you've got a camera crew following you around, so people are looking at you. And, and so, you know, that atmosphere is already created. But you managed to get to the Dome of the Rock. So just tell me about that, what that experience was like and, and uh, approaching the Dome of the Rock. Uh, I'm sure you took a million pictures, too, as well. Oh, but, yeah. But what was going through your mind, and how did you get it arranged? Well, it was, it was something that was arranged by a local fixer who um, told us that, you know, we're really fortunate to have this opportunity because, you know, things are relatively quiet politically, not just there, but around the world. It was a quiet time. And, you know, so we, we, we were lucky enough to get in there. And I have to say, you know, in spite of all the crazy stuff that's going on in the world, everybody that was there, you know, it was 99% Muslims and us. And that day, I didn't see one other uh, Westerner that was inside, uh, you know, the, the area around the Dome of the Rock and the Alaska Mosque. 
And I have to say, they were very polite to us. They left us alone. They didn't stare at us. They didn't, you know, kind of make us feel uncomfortable. I felt, I felt uncomfortable, but I did it to myself. It wasn't because of anything I was feeling. And then once we got inside, um, you know, the... <laughs> Once we got inside the Dome of the Rock, it was it was just amazing. You could see from the video how beautiful it was. And, of course, being a geologist, all that polished stonework was just incredible. And, and then to be able to get down under the Dome into the Well of Souls and have these people coming down and praying, um, I felt like I was intruding. But I, I, honest, I'm telling you, I, I didn't get one, you know, strange look or... Or um, I mean, nobody said a word to us. They just went about their business. They left us alone, and it was it was an amazing experience. I I, I still can't even believe we got down there because I guarantee you, nobody, no Westerners getting down there today. The way things are so uh, tense at the moment. Did it make you feel like uh, the mass media here it has got it all wrong? Because that's obviously what influenced you going in. You know, it's what you know. It's what you see and read here. And, yeah. and then you go and you make the trip and you go to the Dome of the Rock. You go down to the Well of Souls. You're underneath the Dome of the Rock. And, and it was a great experience. It, do you think the mass yeah. media is just misreporting and misrepresenting? No. No, I don't. I think I think they're I, well. Do I believe everything the media tells me? Of course not. But I think in general, when we hear about tension in the Middle East and um, in Jerusalem, I think I, I know that's real. And when I was walking around the walled city, you know, you've got Muslims and Christians and Jews all basically coexisting. I mean, you can feel there's a little tension in the air, but you know what? Everybody just kind of minds their own business and goes on with their lives, like everybody on this planet does and so i didn't really feel much of any of that and i was really surprised at how welcomed uh we were now when it was time for prayer we knew it was time to go and only uh one one of the per, one person in our crew was denied access to uh to a bathroom on the way out they said hey it's time for prayer you guys got to go and they just said no leave right now and and i don't i didn't i didn't feel offended by that it was look they were nice to us it's their time to prayer just you know leave us alone and 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 go and that's cool we we, we left you should have just said hey man let me take off my shoes i'll hang i'll hang let me no 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 i'm not doing that hey, hey, no Scott, uh, they would have known it was bs you kidding uh, uh now when you were down in the well of souls uh you're a rock guy that's what you do and yeah, yeah. and and so the floor uh, obviously, I've never been there, but the floor, you can tell, I mean, it's just the, the, the craftsmanship, and you know that that is just, you know, a really, really nice and built up. But, it's a built up floor, yep. Yeah, but the walls are not, and your right. hands, I was watching you uh, do what you do. You're a rock guy, and you were feeling yep. the walls and kind of looking. What, uh, what did you think, what were you trying to look for? Let me ask you that. Well, uh, first of all, I was just sort of getting uh, a sense of the general trend of the geology. I knew I was looking at carbonates there, or limestones, and they are generally flat-lying rocks. And they were, in this case, they were tilted maybe 25, 30 degrees, and so that wouldn't lend itself to a naturally flat floor. Uh, and so obviously it was built up. But what I was trying to do is to see if there was any real obvious evidence that there was more to it there. I mean, in other words, were there other uh, caverns or openings beyond what I could see? Maybe there was a gap in the rock or something. But it wasn't until after I was there that I went over to the Rockefeller Library and I looked at, and you saw me looking at those drawings by um, uh, Warren, who uh, was there back in the 1860s. And by the way, he was a Freemason. So and he was there with a bunch of other Freemasons. And so as I'm looking at those drawings, and I can see that that well goes down below the floor that I was at, and then it opens up again. They actually show the, show the ceiling of a, of a second cavern below where I was. Right. And then it just stops, but it doesn't end there as far as the drawing goes, so it implies that there's more there. And I personally believe that he knows that that Warren knew that and that he probably did map it. Who knows how far down he went. But 
for whatever reason, he didn't want the public to know. And I bet you somewhere in an archive within uh, some Masonic library somewhere, there's uh, there's drawings that show what else is down there. And by the way, I talked to another uh, Israeli archaeologist who's been, he's one of the prominent um, archaeologists in Israel uh, who's been doing work there for over 50 years. And I asked him point blank, is there more tunnels and, and caves below the Dome of the Rock? He said, absolutely. He says they're endless down there. Well, now, I know you were looking at the floor. Any evidence of uh, one of those... You know, uh, sections of floor uh, that was, you know, that's a trap door, some kind of secret entrance. Well, you know, they had uh, big rugs on the floor, and I just, I wasn't going to start pulling the rugs up. Believe me, in that situation with people coming down, just a constant stream of people, you know, the white guy pulling up the rugs. Yeah. Not to, no, it wasn't going to happen. Good press, though. Good press. You know, you well, know, yeah, well, scout. if I survived. <laughs> <laughs> Scott Walter is now a hostage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, that wouldn't have happened. But at the same time, you have to respect, uh, you know, these people and their faith and, and this, this sacred place to them. It's like the third most holy place to Muslims. So, you know, you have to respect that. Would you, would you agree with them or not is irrelevant. When you're in their house, you have to, you have to abide by their rules. So. Well, uh, okay. Now, uh, uh, tell me the truth. Did you walk around and kind of tap on the floor with your heel? Did you kind of listen for anything that sounded like it, it, it could be? It was pretty solid. I have to say it was pretty solid. I think it's, uh, I think it's a concrete floor. And if there is um, an entrance down there, I mean, it could be somewhere else. Or maybe there is a door, but I didn't find it. Ah, Scott. Scott, I know Sorry, you. man. I, I did the best I could. I know you know. Well, you know, <laughs> it, you know that it's there. The Knights Templar. You know, spent years underneath. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. and that that was their job. That's all that they did was tunnel and search, and and retrieved artifact. They've there. There's all kinds of uh, of evidence uh, about that. So you know, it's there. And I can't believe you got mm -hmm. that far, and you were so close. And you know that you were standing above a tunnel entrance that's going to go to a couple yeah. of more chambers uh, to tunnels that extend all over Jerusalem. Well, I have to say, though, Jimmy, I appreciate what you're saying, and yeah, I would love to have done more, but i got to be honest with you, I was, I was amazed and I was thrilled that we got as far as we did. I didn't even think we'd get inside the building, yeah, I know. let alone down under the Dome of the Rock. So i got to say, I, I thought I did a pretty good job, all things considered. But. No, impressive, man. I, you know, I, was, I literally sat up going... Dude is going to the Dome of the Rock. So anyway, <laughs> um, uh, but what about, uh, Scott, we'll move on in a second, but what about the other end of the tunnels? Uh, uh, you know, where the, is there entrances to the tunnels on the other side that aren't underneath uh, the Dome of the Rock? Well, when you're talking about karst topography, which is what that area absolutely has, uh, there's tunnels and caves everywhere, and you know, is there another entrance to the you know the tunnel system besides right there uh, at the Dome of the Rock? I would be shocked if there weren't multiple entrances. Now I'm sure they've been closed off, and there's doorways, or you know they've been sealed off, or whatever. But uh, I, I know there's other entrances there. There have to be. Now, what was it like? Uh, we're going to be up against a break, but uh, uh, you uh, you got to drive around Israel too, as well. Yeah, and, yeah. And so, what was that like? And were you really in a Range Rover? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah cool. absolutely. I mean, I wasn't driving by myself all the time. We've got our crew with us, but we had a relatively small crew. We had a couple vehicles, and and uh, you know, I got to play. I got to play Indiana Jones and drive around, and then. And that's a lot of fun, but um, no, we went all over Jerusalem, and and we had a very tight schedule. We had to go to certain places, and and they work us they work us pretty hard. But but you know there was some time to walk around, and and I have to say, you know, I've read about all these places, and and of course this is, you know, one of the most well, it's the most holy place in the world, and and it was really. It was really special to be able to go into those places, into the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, and and I mean, just see all these things that you've read about, going back to biblical times and beyond, and 
and it was uh, it was it was really an honor and a privilege to be there. I, I'm telling you, every time I would see something his, of a historical importance, I just paused and just said, "How fortunate am I?" It's, it's now, when you when you drove up the coast, and and here you are, you're in the the last city where the Knights Templar had to uh, to cut and run in Acre. Yeah, you went, you drove up to Acre, and you're there. You're in the last city, you yeah. know, of of the Knights Templar, and you, I mean, for everything that you have done about the history of the Knights Templar, you're there. You're there in Acre. Um, what? How was that for you? And did you see as you looked around? Did you see any evidence of the Knights Templar even being there? Oh yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, the 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 tunnel system that we filmed in that you saw me in was the old tunnel system. The Templars did build those tunnels, and there is an amazing uh, museum that the old uh, walled areas, uh, fortified areas that the Templars built, including the tunnels. Uh, which are about two, three stories underground. And there's, you know, structures built above them that are just incredible. And there's artifacts and displays and weapons and everything else. And there's no question that, you know, we're talking about the Knights Templar and those carvings that I found in the, you know, the, the plaster that still remains, those were carvings made by Templar Knights. And as I said in the show, the, the, some of the symbolism that we, we found is consistent with the belief system, uh, the alternate belief system that myself and other researchers believe that the leadership embraced. So to actually see that stuff, and not many people really truly understand what that stuff really means. I mean, there's, there's multiple meanings for symbolism, but if we are right about what they actually believed, we saw it, you know, carved into the walls. And it must have been very important and meaningful for them to, to carve those symbols and signs there. So it was, uh, and there was a lot more that we didn't show in the show. There's some amazing stuff there, including family, sh- uh, family crests, um, just, Amazing stuff. And uh, wouldn't it have just been the the ultimate if you could have been walking through the tunnel and boom, a hooked axe, you know, on the wall? <laughs> well, believe me, I was looking for it. I know you uh, were. I know you were. Yeah, I know you were. I was looking. I was waiting. I was. I was like, no, watch this. Just watch. <laughs> Scott's going to do a double take, you know, and and go back. But yeah, so no evidence though uh, of a hooked axe or anything that would, uh, you know, maybe. Uh, the start of a hooked X. You know what I mean? Any anything close yeah. to it? Did you find? Well, anything? we saw those X's on the uh, that were carved onto the walls. Um, they were, you know, somewhat crude, but really an X, like we see on the ossuaries uh, in the first century. This is just a symbol of an initiate. If you look up how the old Egyptian pharaohs were buried, they were all initiated, and their priesthood and their viziers, um, they were the PhDs if, of their and masters. Uh, um, scholars of their time, and so uh, they were initiated into the uh, into certain uh, orders, and basically they were taught the ancient mysteries, which are nothing more than the seven classic arts and sciences. They were the colleges of their days. That's what those temples were. They were basically the colleges. So, and and when they were buried, their arms were crossed on their chests in what they call the Osiris pose, and and that that makes an X because they were initiated into this particular sect. Let's take a quick break there, Scott. Stay right there. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church tonight. Scott Walter is with us. This is Fade to Black, bespoke radio for the masses on the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet. I'll be back right after this. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. Always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk, Jimmy Church with Fade to Black. KGRARadio.com Hey everybody, what's up? Jimmy Church of Fade to Black and check this out. The 2015 MUFON Symposium will be held this September 24th through the 27th in beautiful downtown Irvine, California. 
spanning ufology, opening new doors in academia, industry, and media. Former Defense Minister of Canada Paul Hellyer will be there in person. Former CNN news anchor Cheryl Jones, TV news journalist Jaime Musan, and MUFON's chief photo analyst Mark D'Antonio. They're just a few of the growing list of names for the 2015 event. It's September 24th through the 27th at the beautiful Hotel Irvine. Get your tickets today at MUFONSymposium.com. That's MUFONSymposium.com. Go back, Lee Tappy. ¿Qué tal, mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carson, el tiburón. Y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. ¡Claro que sí! Did you ever turn to your radio for your favorite talk show to find that it's been preempted for this? In the air, the deep right center. That goes Lewis to the wall, and it's all here! Or this? And I'm ashamed of you, Hillary, for voting for it. Do you have a favorite talk radio program that's not available in your city? Just go to TalkStreamLive.com for links to the best streaming talk radio shows. At TalkStream Live, you will find live talk shows 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. All your favorites are here. With such a large selection, you will also discover some new favorites. On the go and still want to listen? With the mobile smartphone, simply type TalkStream Live on your internet browser. Now you can take internet radio with with you. You will also find hundreds of music, news, and sports streams. Best of all, the TalkStream Live directory is free and there's never a login required. Remember TalkStreamLive.com, the fastest route between you and your favorite talk radio show. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is revolution. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution is on radio. Ciao. Tonight, Scott Walter is with us. His new show, Pirate Treasure of the Knights Templar. We're talking about that. The first two episodes premiered this past weekend on History Channel. You can go check them out. And, Scott, uh, a couple of things uh, about the show. One, how many episodes are there in this season? Well, two have aired, and we have four more to go. So it's six total, six hours. So you have, uh, there's a lot of stuff that's going to get resolved fairly rapidly then over the next four episodes. Well, you're going to see a lot of stuff. You're going to see me running all over the place. You're going to learn some new things about, uh, about the Templars that I never knew about before. And quite frankly, a lot of the stuff that, that we learned, I think it's going to be in the final two episodes. I don't know. I don't think anybody knows about and and I don't want to know, uh, so don't worry about it. I'm not going there. But let's. Uh, I I just want to see this in real time. <laughs> I won't let you, pal. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and, I, and I haven't even asked off the air too, everybody. Just so you know, I don't want to know. Um, now, uh, episode two ended with the silver bar. Tell us about that. Well, I wish I could tell you more firsthand, but uh, the truth is I have never seen it. Um, when I was there in Madagascar for about 10 days or two weeks, I don't remember, we were there for a long time, uh, Barry's team did not have the permits uh, because I was scheduled to dive on the wrecks and, and you know get wet with, with the guys and maybe find something myself. But um, I, I wasn't able to dive. And then once I left the country, two days later, they... They got the permits, and um, and about I think it was like a week later they they found the the silver bars. So, and what's interesting is uh, there's some controversy about the silver bar. UNESCO uh, was in Madagascar and they did uh, some surveys of 
Barry's work there, and they've made all these claims that, oh, it's not the Adventure Galley, it's not the Fiery Dragon, that's not a silver bar, it's lead. And, and you know, quite frankly, um, you know, people are going to say, well, it's just because you're Barry's friend and you're part of the show, and, and that's not true. Um, I'm very disappointed in the way UNESCO's handled this whole situation because, you know, a month and a half before they even before they even went to Madagascar, they issued a press release saying, "Oh well, he probably did this wrong, and he didn't have the right people, and you know, he's a scallywag, and all this stuff." And and I thought it was really unprofessional. And of course, when they do show up, you know, they basically echoed the same things they'd already said, and. You know, he had the proper people there. If you look, at, we've got, he's got the archaeologists there. They've got the area laid out. They're doing it the right way, and they just don't like him, and they don't want to, you know, they have a history with him, and, and I'm really disappointed in the way they handle it. They were there for four days. They admittedly in their report, they said the water was murky, and you mean to tell me that these guys did a survey in four days and mapped out multiple shipwrecks when it takes weeks under good conditions to do one ship? I mean, it's BS. So anyway, that that's sort of a backdrop, and that's why you see that disclaimer or that little, you know, the text that you see before the show even starts about the controversy. And now I can't tell you if it's silver or lead because I haven't seen it. I haven't tested it. But from my understanding, they did a scratch test and you can't tell the difference between silver and lead with a scratch test. They're about the same hardness. So, um, I think that there's, um, there's some clarification that needs to be done and I'm a geologist. So damn it. Let me look at it. I, I would love to. And if it's lead, I'll tell you if it's silver, I'll tell you. But the reality is the rest of the show from here on, it makes no difference whether it's lead or silver. Um, well, it, it, I mean, it doesn't matter. Can't you just lick it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you can. Uh, I'm not going to, but... <laughs> I mean, it's easy enough to figure out. I mean, why would they... Uh, the only the reason to suggest that it's lead is to discredit everything. That's right. And, and that's the single single reason why they're doing it, and and it's bogus. And, but, you know, they're this international organization, so they can do what they want. But um, And I'm not saying they conduct their business like that all the time. I can tell you that they are out of line in this situation, in my opinion. And I, I've had no contact with them, so I don't have a personal beef. I'm looking at it as a neutral observer. You don't issue a press release about what you're going to find a month and a half before you even go there. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's right. just ridi- that's ridiculous. Uh, why Madagascar, by the way, for the pirates? You know what? what oh was... my God, Jeremy, it's perfect. It's it's, um, and, and I have to say, when I first started this episode, I didn't know anything about any of this stuff. Right. I've learned it all, you know, doing it and being there. But if you think about it at this time, um, and when we're starting to educate people in the show right now about the Order of Christ, which was based in Portugal, that really is the Knights Templar. They just changed their name. Um, and continued on as usual. I mean, the the king and queen of Spain had this, you know, the best fighting force in the world that were holding off the Moors who were trying to conquer Portugal from the south. And even, with, you know, when the put-down happened in 1307, they basically said, like, we're not going to get rid of our fighting force. We're being attacked here. Just leave us alone. And so just to acquiesce to the to the church and um, and the French king, they said, okay, well, We'll call them something different. They're no longer the Knights Templar, they're the Order of Christ, but nothing changed in reality. They just continued on. I, but so 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 then what happened is they started going to the 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 Far East and to India to get to get goods. And they would go from the western coast of Africa around the southern tip into the Indian Ocean. But the East India Trading Company that was based in, in London and uh, in other countries on the, in Europe, they were patrolling the western side of Africa because they wanted to make sure that they were policing the most valuable commodity at the time, which was slaves coming out of Africa. Sure. But on the on the western side, there really was no police force. So it was the wild wild west over there. And when you go around the southern tip of Africa, 
you run right into Madagascar. Uh, but yet, that's that's not where the police force was. It was the perfect sanctuary for pirates. And when the ships would be going to India and the Far East, they would have to go by Madagascar, and they would just pick them off. Uh, I, I wanted to say really quick, the look on your face uh, when you were in Portugal and uh, when when you guys were discussing the Knights Templar and you were like, what, uh, what, what, what? I, I loved it. I, th- oh, you mean the, the interview with yeah. Manuel? Yeah, that was awesome. That was awesome. The, the well, look- I'll tell you what, that guy, he threw a couple of bombs on me that I didn't see coming. And I, I, I mean, I did know about the Order of Christ. And, and so that was a little bit of acting there. But he... He really put some meat on the bones that I was not aware of, and, and that blew me away. But when he started talking about the Nazis being in Tomar and digging in the castle and digging in the floor uh, at uh, Santa Maria de Alabal Church, do you remember that angled slab Yes. that I poured the water on? And yes. I know it didn't look like it drained out on the show, but it really did drain out pretty fast. It took about... 10, 15 seconds for it to drain out, but there was a void underneath there. He told me, and I don't know if he's, if if we're going to do that in the show, the next episode or not, but, um, because I don't know how they, you know, I don't know how they edited the final edit. Right. But he said that when they dug under there, they found stuff. It was, uh, I'm telling you, uh, the audience needs to go and watch those two episodes and watch that interview uh, when Scott is in Portugal. Just, just, just why, when I'm talking about this show actually has substance to it, when, if, if Scott is stopped in his tracks, then, we, yeah. then, then there's stuff going on. It was, it was an actual uh, uh, priceless moment. Um, why the, uh, tell me about the Fiery Dragon. And there, there's five ships in that bay. And uh, I, I think for all of us, when we think of, of pirate ships, we think of the Caribbean. We think, you know, uh, Puerto Rico and Jamaica and, and Haiti. And, you know, we think about that area in Cuba uh, and southern Florida. And that's what we think about. We don't think about Madagascar. And there's all this right. emphasis on the fiery dragon. So well, the Adventure Galley and the Fiery Dragon, yes, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, well, you know, the, the, the big thing here I think that people are going to resonate with, and again, I think they're going to get into the Captain Kidd angle of the story and probably the next couple episodes, maybe the, the next one. Uh, and I flesh that out uh, pretty far. And I learned a lot. We learned a lot more about Captain Kidd than I ever knew. And he was there. And what's interesting is that ship was a ship that he scuttled. It was um, full of worms, and it was leaking, and and it had been repaired multiple times. And and these ships had a shelf life, and when that shelf life was used up, they just scuttled them. They just, you know, set them on fire and sank them, and that's exactly what they did. The only difference was Captain Kidd ran it up on shore and then set it on fire so they could salvage the metal. But as Barry was pointing out in the show, the, the the cabin of Captain Kidd's would have been in the back of the ship, and it would have been in about, well, it's in about 15 feet of water. And Barry thinks that there's, that he stashed some things in his cabin, and that made sense. Now, some people are saying, well, why would he um, scuttle his treasure and leave it at the bottom? Well, there's, there's any number of reasons he could have done that. His, um, apparently his crew didn't care for him at that time, so maybe he was keeping their booty from him. Maybe he planned to go back and get it at some future time. Maybe he said, screw it, and I'm just going to leave it here, and no one's ever going to find it. I, I mean, who knows? Um, but um, we think uh, that bar is, is connected to it. Well, I, it, it's simple to me. And when I think about how shallow the water is, and when Barry throws the rock, right, and he goes, you know, the ship is right there, right? And he, and yeah. he throws that rock out. Um, it's easy to get to. It's not in a couple of hundred feet of water. It's right there. You could walk out, right? And, and right. He could he could sink it and then it, and go and retrieve something at a later date. He know it's well. At, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's at least semi safe, semi protected. It's only under fifteen feet of water. So there you go. Uh, that's well, you have to rem- you have to remember another thing. Madagascar and Ile Saint Marie and Pirate Island. I mean, you're talking about 
Pilot Island is an island in a cove on an island, which is off the coast of an island, which is off the coast of a continent. I mean, this is way the hell out there. There was nobody else there. So, you know, other than the islanders that were living there that they basically could control pretty easily, there's nobody else there. I mean, even today, it's remote as hell. I mean, it's just way out there. I can't wait uh, for the next four episodes, man. It's uh, it's going to be good. And uh, <laughs> congratulations. And I, it was when you were telling me uh, uh, off the air and we were talking about this uh, series, uh, I could tell about the excitement uh, uh, in your voice that it was actually, you know, this was going to be great. And I'm really looking forward to it. I'm not kissing yeah. up to you. It's a, just, I just no, feel no, good. I I appreciate it, and 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 I have to say, I've I had way more fun, and it, this was way more interesting. I learned more on this uh, on this series than I have in anything else I've done. It was really incredible, and to, and to have it be connected to the Knights Templar, to Freemasonry, to pirates. I mean. Can you bet, get a better cocktail of topics? I don't think there is. No, you, <laughs> you, you can't. You can't. And uh, before we change topics, uh, over in Twitter, Deuce Guy says, Jimmy, please ask Scott about uh, the connections of the Templars and Oak Island. And you know what? We can't really do a show <laughs> with you uh, without having that question come up. So let, yeah. let's, let's just get it out there now. Well, okay. Um, I, I have to give you a little bit of a disclaimer because... Um, uh, there's another show on the same network um, called The Curse of Oak Island, and, and I, I don't want to say anything that would in any way compromise that show. But uh, I will say this. Do, do I think that there's a connection with the Tempers in Oak Island? Yes. Do I think they were there? Absolutely. Do I think that um, something was buried there? Um, probably. And uh, so I guess I'll just leave it at that. Okay, fair enough. I, I think we all mm -hmm. feel the same way. Mm -hmm. You know, I uh, again, I want that show to resolve, and and it's on the same network. I've got a show on that network that I appear on too, as well. So we all need to, you know, just just hope. I, I just hope that uh, uh, those two brothers actually, uh, you know, get some uh, uh, get get some closure. They've had a huge yeah. investment on that island. Huge. And, and well, they've they've put a lot of energy and emotion and and money into, you know, into this venture, and they've probably gone farther than anybody has in history. And I, I'll tell you this: I've never met the guys. I don't know either one of them. They both seem like nice guys. I I certainly have nothing against them, and I wish them luck. Um, but I think, um, um. You know, if they if they don't come up with something soon, then you know I don't know. I guess if it was me, <laughs> I would uh, I'd probably pack up and go home. Well, me, I, I would just I'm, I'm serious. I would move the island. I would dig. I would just I, I'd make it a crater. That's what I would do. I would just dredge <laughs> the whole thing up. I just I would move. Well, it's pretty much been dredged, yeah, man. They they turned that island upside down and. You know, you got to remember, it's a glacial, erratic, uh, and moraine island. So, uh, geologically, it's pretty straightforward as far as what it is. Now, once you get down to bedrock, it's a little bit of a different story. But they've uh, they've 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 gone after that place pretty hard over over 200 years. Yes, when you look at the aerial photography over the years of uh, of all of the expeditions that have done there and all the mining and the wells. Uh, it's not big. First off, Oak Island is tiny. It's tiny. It's yeah. Tiny. And when you look at some of, the, I mean, they, man, they, yeah, they pulled a lot of dirt out of there. And you look <laughs> at, you look at uh, some of the uh, the excavations over the years, and you just think, what could possibly be left? You know, I mean, but like I said, I would just move it. I would, I would, I would move it. I'd make, I'd move Oak Island to the south about a hundred yards. I'd take all of that dirt. I'd build a new island. And I would I would dig that thing down. I would remove it all. That's what I would do. That's what I would do. Otherwise, we may not get to the bottom of it. But this chamber that they found, let's 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 see. Let's just uh, let's yeah. See. Well, um, they teed it up. I say let's let's bring it, guys. Let's see what you got. Now let's talk about uh, the last uh, couple of shows that you've done with us. You left me hanging. And uh, I'll take the audience back to about a year ago when uh, Scott was on the show and 
uh, I got to ask five questions, and and I got pretty close. And 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 now that I know what I know, and we're going to discuss all of this now, I did get pretty dang close, didn't I? I must have made you. Yeah, pretty you were uncom- close. You yeah. were close. You, I mean, you know, close, but no cigar. No. Sorry, buddy. Well, you didn't give me the cigar. <laughs> That's why. But but uh, now uh, for everybody, you can go to Scott Walter Answers dot blogspot dot com. That's the website. Uh, he uh, posted a great uh, article. Uh, it's almost a research paper, actually. Uh, and that was posted on August 25th. So uh, not even a month ago, right? August, yeah, yeah, yeah it's even... been just a couple weeks ago. Yeah, yeah two, three weeks ago. And uh, so the article is up there. It's complete with uh, uh, photographs, uh, references. Everything is there. It's uh, pretty comprehensive. It's pretty detailed. And it discusses what uh, I was trying to get out of Scott a year ago. And I will also say this. Scott thought about writing a book. And the way that you present it in the article, Scott, is pretty cool in that you could have waited for another year or two to bring all of this out. Or let's just do it now and and let the chips fall where they may. Well, yeah. And... I mean, I, for me to sit on something for over a year is like unprecedented. I mean, I'm terrible at keeping secrets uh, unless they're really important. But I mean, I if I have you know good news or something I'm excited about, I wanna I wanna share it with people. And oh man, did I want to share that one? But but to be honest with you, there were a couple things. One is is it was very very important, and I wanted to make sure that I vetted out as much as I possibly could before, you know, releasing it. And it was really a discovery that was a joint discovery with Charlie Pellegrino and, and some other people. So they they came to me and said, hey, can you help us with this? This is what we think. And then when I came back and said what I thought, they all said, oh, my gosh, now we see what you're talking about. We agree with you. And so, you know, I, I mean, there's there's some people that that think that, you know, Every time I open, you know, the cereal box, I find a hooked X. And um, believe me, I'm looking for them, but I'm also my own toughest critic at times because, you know, I, I can't say something unless I can back it up with, with evidence. And so I wanted to be sure that I knew what I was looking at, but I wanted to be sure that it was vetted out as much as I could before releasing it. And then the people that shared it with me were comfortable, so... Once that bar was met, um, I just decided I'm not going to wait and do it in a book. Let's just get the paper out there, and so we did. Okay, so let's uh, let's let's jump into this. And this whole story <laughs> isn't without its its uh, controversy too, as well. And we'll we'll cover all of that. So yeah, uh, go ahead. Let's uh, let's start with the uh, excavation of the tomb. What are we talking about? And let's right. start at the beginning, and then sure. uh, we'll somehow get to the end of it. Okay. Well, I, I think that it all started in 1980 in, in, uh, in southern Jerusalem, about two miles from, from the Temple Mount in, uh, in uh, a neighborhood called the East Telpiat neighborhood. They were blasting the hillside in preparation for building apartment buildings, and they were doing the foundation work. And, and when they blasted the hill, they discovered a first century underground tomb that had been cut into the bedrock. And you know, these are not rare. I mean, they do find them throughout the city, but these were um, tombs that belonged to people of means. I mean, you couldn't, you know, the common people didn't have tombs like this. Anyway, so they um, they uh, went into this tomb, and they found 10 ossuaries, which are stone boxes that uh, the deceased are interred in. And basically what happens is, only the family can process the body of uh, a deceased loved one. And they would uh, anoint the body in the front room, what they call the antechamber, with perfumes and oils. And then they would bring the body inside the burial chamber uh, and place them on, on a bench or um, um, you know, a ledge cut in, into the rock inside the tomb. And they would leave the body there for one to two years. Uh, the body would decompose. They would come back and collect the bones and put them inside these these limestone boxes called ossuaries 
but they were only big enough so that the two largest bones in the body, the femurs, would fit inside crossed, and then they would put the skull in last. And as I said on the show, this is the origin of the skull and crossbone symbol, which is obviously a symbol of death, but it's also a symbol of reverence uh, for Jesus. And it's also and the, the pirate flag. That's the pirate flag, right. And yes. so this is actually, in my opinion, would be uh, evidence that supports that at least some of the pirates probably uh, had Templar connections or were Templars or people that embraced their ideology. And, you know, sometimes when we talk about Templars, um, it's sort of a catch-all phrase, and, and we're talking about people that embraced a particular ideology. But anyway, so they found ten ossuaries in this tomb, Seven of them were inscribed with names, six in Aramaic, one in Greek. And the names are things like Jesus, son of Joseph. Another one is James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. Another one is Yose, um, or James. Another one is Matthew. Another one says Maria. Another one says Judah, son of Jesus. And probably the most interesting uh, box of all, the only one carved in Greek, uh, it says Mariamne the Mara. And Mariamne is basically a pet name uh, for Mary Magdalene found in the Acts of Philip. And the Mara is a title of honor, as in Lord, Master, or Queen. So... That's a pretty interesting cluster of names. And, of course, the debate has been, well, these are common names and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, no. <laughs> the odds of those names all being in one tomb together and them not being the biblical family of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, and, and their family members is about 600,000 to one conservative, conservatively. And, then, so, and what about, yeah. uh, before we uh, 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 get into yeah, the, yeah. the details, there's a couple of things that, that stick out here. One, uh, was Greek something that was common on ossuaries back in the first century? Uh, that That's strange. And two, the other one with Judah's name and, and Jesus the father. Did Jesus have a son named Judah? Well, apparently. <laughs> I mean, based on based on... That evidence, I would say it's clear, and I have heard uh, some pretty interesting arguments that if you carefully read the Bible and some of the stories in the Bible, there is a little boy running around uh, during the crucifixion, and um, a lot of people think that, that that was a son, and maybe that's Judah. Well, I mean, I don't know, but, but if, if it's, the box says Judah, son of Jesus... I don't know how more explicit you can get. I mean, yeah, yeah. I suppose there's other possibilities, but I, the most parsimonious explanation is it's his son. Yeah, and if you're going to hoax something, uh, you're going to be a little bit. Uh, you're going to be a little more cautious than making some kind of, you know, a blatant. Nobody, mistake. nobody, no one has made any claims that this is a hoax. That's not even. That's well, not even on the table yeah, here. But you understand what I'm saying. That's, that's right. Uh, right. You, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you'd be more clever than that. You'd be yeah. a little more clever than uh, making that kind of uh, mistake. So it was deliberate, and I just find that very, very strange. And certainly, that would turn history on its ear. Uh, it just, it just well, in its own. I, Everything else yeah. is is pretty crazy and extraordinary, but that is it. Just sticks out to me, and also. Uh, uh, Miriam being in Greek. Yeah. Well, you know what, and I'm not an expert on this, so I don't want to pretend to be, but my understanding is there are a number of ossuaries that have been found with Greek inscriptions on them. I guess that's not that unusual, but, um, you know, why was hers? I, I don't know the answer to it, but I can tell you there is a reason. We just we just don't know at this time. Maybe we will in the future, maybe we won't. But, you know, the, the other thing, you, you brought up the whole idea that this is, you know, this is, controversial and this is going to turn, you know, some people, you know, their beliefs on their ear. I mean, to me, is this really that surprising? I mean, if you just, if you take the faith aspect out of it for a second, you just look at it pragmatically. I mean, if Jesus was a rabbi, I mean, in, in, in his time, he was required to not only be married, but by the age of 30 to have a son for secession. 
So, I mean, if you look at the tradition, I mean, this is expected, really. This isn't a surprise at all. Well, and and the other part is uh, these are the names uh, of Jesus' family. And it, it's it's all there. What was on the other three ossuaries? There was uh, 10 that was found, one that was lost, uh, seven have been labeled as family members. What was on the other three? Well, the one that was lost, the controversial James ossuary, that has been resolved. I mean, the testing that's been done uh, proved that that ossuary, um, which was bought on the antiquities market, funny, right around 1980 when it went missing because the archaeologists documented 10 ossuaries inside the tomb, but only nine made it to the antiquities archives. One one disappeared, and then it showed up. But what they did was they tested the, um, the geochemical profile of the tomb and all of the other ossuaries. It was very unique, it had a very unique geochemical profile, and they tested the James ossuary just in the past year, and it was a spot-on match. Now, everybody, I mean, most people that, you know, were, I guess I would call reasonable and didn't have a horse in the race and looked at the whole situation objectively, um, it made all the sense in the world that this was the tenth missing missing ossuary, but science proved it. And once you add in that name into the mix, I mean, it's the it's really the case is over. I mean, this is this is the Jesus family tomb, and it's it's incredible on one hand, but um, I guess it's you know, <laughs> if this guy lived and had a family and would died and was buried, he's, he's somewhere and. And here's where it appears he is. Well, you know, we've been waiting for like a real Bible relic, you know, something. You know, the uh, the cross, uh, the spear of destiny, all of these things that have been talked about uh, and problems with auth- authenticating over the years. But here we have uh, a, an actual reference. And if you remember, what was the uh, the little... Uh, uh, the little, uh, oh, the little um, uh, ivory piece that was found that was supposed to be part of uh, uh, King Solomon's temple, and then that turned out to be a forgery. What was it? A little pomegranate or something, wasn't it? Oh, I, I, I don't even remember that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm not, I'm not aware of that one. But hey, listen, you know, one of the arguments that the, the, you know, scholars always have, and, and archaeologists about all these controversial. Discovery says, well, do we have it in an archaeolo- you know, a, a pristine archaeological context? Well, the answer to that question in this case is absolutely. Were things handled perfectly? No. But is this about as perfect a context as you could reasonably expect? Absolutely. And so, you know, the debate has been on for the last, you know, s- several years. But actually what happened is the archaeologists who, who processed the tomb basically said nothing to anybody. They just cataloged everything and they they archived it. And anybody at the time, including one of the archaeologists who supposedly, his wife came out here recently and said that he believed, and he's deceased now, he died a couple years after the tomb was discovered, but she said that privately he believed that he had found the tomb of Jesus, but while he was living, he denied it until he died. And who can blame him? You know, he he didn't want to be the one that discovered Jesus's tomb and 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 uh, and made him human. So um, it, it's it's a fascinating story, and it really isn't going to be um, settled or uh, really put to rest in a in a reasonable, quiet, calm way until a few years go by. Because too many people are spun up. There's a lot at stake, and of course, faith. Um, is being, you know, questioned on some people. It shouldn't be, but it, but it is. And so I think we just got to let some time go by before this can be calmly and objectively looked at. And I think the obvious uh, will prevail. I mean, it's it's obvious what we're looking at here. Well, it, exactly. Now, let's talk about exactly what we're looking at. I want you to tell me the first time that you saw the uh, I'll, I'll I'll let you. I don't want to spoil it. Go ahead. You, right. you're, lo- you're looking at well, the, you're looking at the lid, and you must have uh, been short of a, a heart attack. 
Well, I, I, you know, it's funny because I, when I, I did my latest book, Akhenaten of the Founding Fathers, I, I laid it all out about the, about the Telpiat tomb and the Jesus Ashwin. And there's a lot of interesting questions about the inscription itself and the big X in front of his name on, on the box. But, and that's been published, and if you go on the internet, you can find it in two seconds. But what I never expected, and I never even thought about, was the lid. And it turns out that there's carvings on the lid, and they've never been published. People just dismiss them as as Mason's marks or alignment marks. And I was sent photographs by Charlie Pellegrino, who wrote the first book about the Telpiat tomb with um, Simca Giacobavici, and... Um, I, they and he wrote a note. He was he, he uh, was introduced to me by a mutual friend, and he said, "Scott, I, I know you understand a lot about symbolism. We think this is a star symbol on the lid of the Jesus ossuary. Um, what do you think?" And when I opened the pictures, I mean, I was I just was taken aback. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, "Are you kidding me?" And what I saw was not a star symbol. I mean, if you look at it clearly, it's not a star. Um, it's actually a monogram of two symbols. And one of those symbols is my hooked X. And, I mean, it is no question, it is a hooked X. It is the hooked X. And I, I uh, well, to say I was surprised, I couldn't believe it. But there's also another symbol, a Tau cross, which is basically, it looks a lot like a capital T, except, you know, the vertical line is, is longer than a typical T. But this is this this is an Egyptian symbol. It goes back to the the Egyptian Ankh is basically uh, a tau cross with a handle with a loop, egg shaped loop, and this is a symbol of restored life of resurrection. It's it's probably the most important Egyptian symbol uh, that they had, and this is on the Jesus ossuary, which it's a monogram. So it's two symbols: the hooked X, which in Aramaic looks very much like the Hebrew Aleph, the first uh, symbol in that alphabet, and the Tau is the last symbol. So could it, and I said, could it represent the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and end? And I know that Jesus certainly said that in the Bible. So, And that's, it, that's an interesting yeah. point. And now, I just tweeted out uh, uh, the picture. And I want the audience to understand exactly what we're looking at here. And uh, I want to make this very clear. When you look at the picture, if somebody was carving, and let's say it was the guy that made the ossuary, let's just say that, and that's what he wanted to make was a star, then you intersect all of those. You don't miss the center of the star. You're carving. The, you know, you just don't do that. I see... With two symbols overlaying each other. It's deliberate and it's obvious. And I know that th th that's the way that you looked at it too, Scott, at first. But once you once you realize that and you see that it's off center, it's obviously it's just two symbols that are, are that are overlaying each other. And when it's you, a monogram, it's, it's a, a monogram of two symbols. That's yes. it. That's it. And now you know. I just tilt my head just a little bit, and that hooked X is is it's. It's crazily obvious. It, that yeah. is not a mistake. No, 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 no. <laughs> well, let's put it this way. Um, I, I wrote back to uh, to Simka and James and Charlie and um, and Jerry, um, and and they all just said, "My God, that's it. That's it. <laughs> that's that's exactly what that is." And and these guys aren't, you know, like my buddies that are just going to agree with everything I say. They they're. I, I mean, you can't not see it. I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> certain certain skeptics say they don't see it, but they don't want to see it. I mean, it's obvious. And now the the, the question is, where did it come from? I mean, what and, and is it really the hook? That, is it really my hook? X? Now, hey, I'm I'm looking at the tweet here. Did you? Oh, you? I'm looking here because you you put out the other hook X, which is the one for the Westford Knight. Uh, no, that's somebody else. I don't think that's me. Oh, okay, okay. I guess I haven't seen yours yet because I'm like, that's not it. 
No, but that's another is, one. That's another one, though. Yeah, no. I, I posted figure two, the hooked X, towel cross monogram. Okay, got it, got carved it. Carved yep. in the okay. lid, lid of the Yeshua Jesus ossuary. All right. My bad, man. I'm sorry. That yeah. was, was Twitter. Twitter. Flies, I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah. Twitter flies by so fast, man. I don't even know what you're looking at. <laughs> okay, but but anyway, um, uh, the beginning and the end. And and you look at this. It, it That's exactly what it says. And uh, now this is this is the other thing that I find really interesting here, Scott, is when you look at the hooked X portion of it, that layer. Those are two straight lines. Perfect. It can't be misconstrued. That's a deliberate no. X with a hook on it. I mean, it's it's yeah. very, 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 very deliberate. Well, I, I, I that's what I think, and and, and you know, <laughs> again, the, I guess the only question is: is it really? Is it the same hooked X? Is it? Is it? Does it have the same meaning as, as what I've interpreted it to be? Does it really have a connection to the Egyptian cross, crook, and the flail, which I think represents the ideology that, that I believe Jesus and his followers embraced and the leadership of the Templar embraced? Uh, so that's the only question. But, I mean, from a scientific standpoint, you know, the thesis I've laid out includes Jesus. And then to, to suddenly see the hooked X fall into place there, that's consistent. Now, is it definitive proof? I guess that's that's to be decided. I, to me, it is, but um, I'll let others debate, you know, debate that question. But I think at the end, you're going to have a hell of a time proving that that's not what it is. How big is it? Well, um, you know, I actually saw it with my own eyes, yeah, and I, I didn't want to publish anything until I could say I actually saw it. And I was on vacation with my family in March in San Diego, and we took a day. We drove up to Los Angeles to the Dead Sea Scrolls exhibition where this and the Mary Ossuary uh, were on display. I should say the Mary M. Nay Ossuary. And it was right up against the glass. And that end of the ossuary was right there. I got my eyeballs literally within about four inches of it, and I could see it clear as a bell. It's probably about an inch tall. Wow. It's big. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, some people have said, oh, it's a Mason's mark or it's an alignment mark. Well, it's not a Mason's mark because Mason's marks, um, you know, would be simpler than that. And if it's an alignment mark, it would have a matching mark on the box. And this this doesn't have that. It's And its orientation is front and center, top and here it is, and it's it's intentionally placed. It's carefully done, and it's important. Um, there's, you know, it's there's there no, it is. yeah. There's no question that it's a hooked X and the towel crossed, and it's the two of them uh, overlaid, or one is overlaid the other. That's it. There is now. What is it, and what is 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 its significance? Is it the same hooked X? You know, that's that's where we got to go next. But what it right. definitely is. Is it uh, a towel cross and a hooked X? Somebody just tweeted out, it looks like three symbols to me. No, Dennis, it is only two. Uh, look at the, you have to look at this and, and read read Scott's full article so you understand what the towel cross is. We all know what the hooked X is. But when yeah. you see it, and then you go back and look at it, it's obvious as to what it is. Now, Scott, the other point that I want to uh, uh, I want everybody to understand you came out to Los Angeles and you saw this at the Dead Sea Scrolls exhibit that has been touring the country. And you went out. They wouldn't have this ossuary there on display unless it has been fully vetted and they wouldn't have something out that wasn't what it's supposed to be. Well, you know, they don't bring attention to it being, quote, the Jesus Ossuary. They they say what it is, they, they identify it properly, but um, they don't make any point of saying that it's the Jesus Ossuary, Jesus, the biblical Jesus. Uh, they don't make any mention of the hooked X tail cross on the lid. In fact, most people don't even you know, in the uh, the biblical circles really paid any attention at all. Well, they will now, but up until now, no one's even mentioned it. It's not published anywhere. Um, 
You know, and it's been, what, 35 years since it was discovered? It's been there the whole time, and, and nobody noticed it. But, you know, in fairness to them, they don't know anything about the hooked X. They don't know anything about this, this alternate uh, historical narrative that we've been working on all this time. Um, how would they know? They, they just didn't, they weren't aware of it. But to their credit, the minute I pointed it out to them, they go, oh, yeah, I see it. And they all agree, every one of them. And, and what's the significance of the chevron that is right below it? I have no idea. <laughs> Maybe that's the Mason's mark. Um, you know, and, and when I first got those pictures, it wasn't until I wrote the paper that I even saw the chevron in that picture. And um, I, when I really paid attention to the chevron, because I was writing about it, but I did not... Um, uh, you know, I just don't know yet, but uh, that's another question. It's, but it's far enough away that it doesn't, it's not part of, well, if that's what the tweet was talking about, there's a third symbol there, he's right. But it's not, it's not connected to the, uh, to the hook next towel. Uh, what, what, uh, what is Israel saying about this? Have you taken uh, any of this to your friends over there? What are they saying about this in Jerusalem and the Antiquity Authority and, and so forth? <laughs> Well, Simka is uh, planning to publish it on his blog, which millions of people read, so it really hasn't even gotten out there yet. I know there's a couple of other journals that are planning on publishing it, so really, um, we're, get, we're ahead of the game right now. Um, there really hasn't been a lot of people who have weighed in. I mean, you know, there have been some people that have come on my blog, the usual skeptics, which, you know, they don't accept anything that you say, but... Uh, you know, that's, you know, I, I mean, most people just say, well, I see what you're talking about. And they, they get it, you know. Do you think, do you think you'll be able to, do you think you'll be able to knock some sense into them that, that it no. isn't just. What, the skeptics? Well, no, no, no. Never, no, no, never. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, let's not go there. Never. I'm talking about, uh, it, you know, Jerusalem itself and, and that there, this isn't. Uh, you know, a maker's mark, and this isn't uh, a monogram oh, of the artist. Oh, yeah. No, I think the reasonable people are going to see it, too. I mean, come on, just look at it. It's just, I'm not making this up, and uh, and I didn't, I'm not the one that, that you know, that, well, I, I mean, I was the one that brought it to their attention, but they brought it to me. And so this isn't, uh, you know, something that I, I made up, and I mean, my God. And, and think about it, Jimmy, just think about this for a second, Okay. Before I knew about this, if we're sitting here talking, and, and, and after all the research I've done, you said, Scott, if there was one place that you could find a hooked X, that if you could put it anywhere in the world, if you could just you could have your way, where would you find it? I wouldn't even dream of putting it on the Jesus Ashori land. I wouldn't even I wouldn't even go there. Right. And that's where it is. It's like you got to be kidding me. You, now, can't, you, you can't make this up. You can't. Now, I want to go down to, uh, I was a little confused about one thing, and I just, I need your help on this. When you show the uh, the Freemason, uh, I don't even know what you call it, the apron, the pouch, whatever. Masonic apron? Yeah. The Mas yeah, and, with the, with the, yeah, with the triple towel. Yeah, where is the triple towel there? I've, I've been trying to find it. Oh, oh, of course, it's up at the top in the triangle. Yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. Okay, I didn't catch and, that. And what's interesting here, check this out. What's interesting is that the circle and the delta, the triangle, are two Masonic symbols that represent the deity, God. And the triple tau is inside of that. So obviously it's pretty important. Uh, now, in Masonry, they, they, there are three tows that go together. And I talk about that symbolism and how it relates to to Jesus, to Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, and and it's very important in something called Scottish Rite Masonry. But um, it, yeah, I mean it's 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 a very very important symbol, very important, and it's on the Jesus Ossuary lid. So the question that I have, and and I think that this there's there's an argument that could be made. And we haven't even talked about the fact that there's evidence that somebody entered that tomb a long time ago, possibly during the First Crusade, and left a telltale calling card, three skulls placed in a triangle inside the tomb. And funny, those, those, those skulls were placed in the east, the south, 
and the west parts of the tomb. Now, any Freemasons that are out there listening will uh, be smiling right now because they will recognize those cardinal directions and what they mean. But um, if the Templars were in that tomb, and it makes all the sense in the world that they would have been there during the First Crusade. Maybe that was one of the reasons that they fought the First Crusade, to control the city of Jerusalem, so they could go into that tomb. Some people like me have suggested it was their ancestral family tomb, that Jesus was their ancestor. Um, they would go in with reverence. And in fact, nobody, uh, you know, all of the ossuaries are there. Nobody, nothing was stolen, nothing was was uh, desecrated as far as we know, um, and that would make sense. You wouldn't do that to your own family tomb. If your great-great-grandfather, you were in his tomb, what would you do? You would, you'd be there with reverence. So the question is, did they see that? Did they take that symbol from the lid, or did they put it there? Some people have suggested that. These are all questions that we're hoping to address in the future when we get a chance to examine these ossuaries. Will you be able to actually uh, uh, physically touch them and actually go and, 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 and look at that? My, because my question is, uh, with that inscription, the, you know, the, uh, the Tau Cross uh, hooked X section, uh, and be able to tell that it was the same person that carved the name. Right, right. And that, those, are, those are the exact kinds of questions that we're going to be looking into for sure. Well, what did your eyeballs tell you? Well, you know what? I, to be honest with you, I, I had a, a, a guy, there was a, secu- there was a security guard that was watching me pretty closely because I was paying a little too much attention there. I wanted to take a picture, uh, but we weren't allowed to, so that's why I posted a sketch of it uh, instead of a photo because they wouldn't let me take a photo. But the lighting was bad anyway. It was direct lighting overhead, so you could barely see it. In fact, if you didn't know it was there, you probably wouldn't have seen it, but I knew it was there, and then that's why I saw it. But um, we're looking to, to have a chance to uh, do an in-depth analysis on, on all the ossuaries uh, in the coming months, and there are a lot of questions we're going to try to answer, and those are just some of them. Well, the na- th- this is because I like where you're going with this. Uh, I look at it, and it doesn't – it looks, it looks uh, uh, better – than the name inscription on the ossuary and the other ones too as well. Not it just. looks like it, it. In other words, it looks like it was made with a different hand. Yeah, different, more modern tools, if you will, too as well. If it, well, maybe, maybe I, I I don't know about that, but I, I you know, you got to be careful about that. But that those are that, that's one of the questions we're going to try to address, and I think I think we're going to be able to to get some answers. Well, let's let's suppose a couple of things, Scott. Okay. Let's let's suppose the Knights Templar arrive in Jerusalem, and they find out where Jesus's family is entombed, and it, you know it's thirteen hundred years after, right? I, you know, mm-hmm. Let me do my math: twelve hundred, twelve hundred thirty years it's later. About, it's about well, when they yeah, it would have been well, this would have been when they captured Jerusalem would have been right around eleven hundred. So this is. Just, uh, just over a millennium later. Okay, millennia later. So they find out where the tomb is, and they go, and they leave their mark there. Well, they would have had, uh, you know, some real steel, you know, so, you know, something else to tool with as opposed to what was going on, uh, you know, at 30 A.D. or whenever this tomb was, you know, 100 A.D., whenever it was. Yeah. Uh, whenever they were in well, they, well, you got to remember something. This is limestone, so it's not exactly a tough rock. And so it would have been pretty easy to carve. And I've been to Jerusalem, and I looked around at the, the local rocks. There's a lot of chert there. And chert is what, you know, natives make arrowheads out of and blades and knives. And, and I'll tell you what, it'll cut that stuff like a hot knife through through butter. So it's not it really – and I'm not trying to buzzkill your comment, but – um, I, you, again, you have to be careful about how you interpret these things because um, I, I, I agree it looks like it was made with a different hand, but as far as the timing goes, I, personally, I think the most simple explanation is, is it was there at the time the box was made and the person, you know, Jesus was interred in there, but not necessarily. That's that's what we want to try to answer. Hey, you know what? Both 
both both stories are incredible. I mean, both. Yeah, both you could make an argument for either one. It would. I mean, if the Knights Templar were there and they left their mark, how <laughs> extraordinary is it with the hooked X? Scott Walter. Well, that's pretty good, but you know what? I actually like the story of them going in the tomb and seeing the mark, both marks, and using the towel and the hooked X as secret symbols that only they knew that were so important to them. You know, that's a, that's a pretty good plan, too, man. I, I like that story. I, I like them both. I like all three, you know. <laughs> But, yeah, it's just when I look at it, I'm serious, and I want the audience to understand what we're looking at here. When I look at it, it can't be anything but what it should be, which is it's a hooked X with the towel cross. That's, that it can't be anything. What else could it be? What are the critics saying that this is? It's just a star? It's just... It's, it's just and, well, they, well, no, they, the only thing that I've heard is... Uh, I, I, I just don't think that's what it is. Well, okay, well, we're happy for you. You don't have any reasoning. You <laughs> just don't want it to be that. And then the other thing is they say that it's an alignment mark. Well, that's a pretty elaborate, I mean, the, the alignment marks that I've seen, and there's, there's actually a, uh, a catalog of all the marks made um, on Jewish ossuaries, and the alignment marks are usually just uh, maybe a small uh, crudely made X with a matching one on on the um, on the box and then on the lid, and they're right next to each other. There's nothing there's nothing else next to this symbol, and in fact, it's not near the edge. It's actually down. It's on the end, but it's not right up against the edge. So, it, it, and even even the uh, scholars that have written about um, the marks, well, actually, there is some text that's written about this mark. Um, but they don't show a picture of it. They say that it's not an alignment mark, so that argument isn't going to go very far. No, if it's and an, it's not, uh, and it's not one. <laughs> if if it's an alignment mark, then it's aligning to another mark. It's that simple. That's it. Yeah, That's well, it. I mean, yeah. if there was another one of these next to next to it on the uh, the rim, uh, you know, the edge, the lip, if you will, like I've seen it cataloged in other places. Well, then that that's it. But no. It's a, it's a pretty extraordinary discovery for you. And, oh, and the other thing is that uh, those skeptics out there need to realize the, uh, I don't know what you call the hooked part of the hooked X. Uh, what do you call that? They call it the hook. The, the hook. It's, <laughs> it's, not on the other, it's not on the other side. It's where, well, it's, it, it's, where it's, it's supposed to be. Yeah, well, it's, 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 and it is where it's supposed to be. It's, I mean... You know, <laughs> it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, and it does all those things, then it must be a hooked X. <laughs> uh, we're at the top of the hour, Scott. Stay right there. Let's take a break, and then when we come back, let's take some phone calls. Sounds great. Looking forward to that. Let's do it. This is Fade to Black. Tonight, we are with Scott Walter. This, uh, I'm telling you right now, you need to go to Scott Walter Answers, blogspot.com. ScottWalterAnswers.blogspot.com. Go and check that out. The links are at jimmychurchradio.com. You know exactly what we're talking about. Taking your phone calls when we come back. This is Fade to Black, right? Uh, 30 seconds. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, the Metal God, on jimmychurchradio.com. KGRA Radio. Intelligent Talk. Are you a paranormal investigator, ghost hunter, or UFO sky watcher? If so, FNGinnovations.com has the product you definitely need in your investigations kit or go bag. Introducing the Morpholite Wide Beam Tactical Flashlights that put the light where you need it most. Traditional flashlights shine a focused round beam with limited line of sight in the dark. Morpholite Tactical Flashlights change all that, utilizing a revolutionary wide beam design to enable you to see safety hazards such as hanging wires and steel, pipes and holes in the floor you just can't see with a focused round beam. In the field, where safety is paramount, a 180 degree beam increases orientation and peripheral vision in the dark. Morpholite flashlights are ideal for investigations in abandoned facilities such as houses and hospitals, factories, caves and tunnels. Avoid those low hanging tree branches that poke your eyes in the woods. Visit FNGinnovations.com to see a full line of tactical lights and accessories. That's FNGInnovations.com.
Now you can find all your favorite talk radio shows live all in one place at TalkStreamLive.com. Listen from anywhere, office, home, or in your car. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com and click on one of the many live talk show hosts you want to listen to. It's free and easy. No computer? Download the smartphone apps. Never miss your favorite talk show. Find them all at TalkStreamLive.com. Hey everybody, what's up? Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and check this out. The 2015 MUFON Symposium will be held this September 24th through the 27th in beautiful downtown Irvine, California. Expanding ufology, opening new doors in academia, industry, and media, former Defense Minister of Canada Paul Hellyer will be there in person. Former CNN news anchor Cheryl Jones, TV news journalist Jaime Musan and MUFON's chief photo analyst, Mark D'Antonio. They're just a few of the growing list of names for the 2015 event. It's September 24th through the 27th at the beautiful Hotel Irvine. Get your tickets today at MUFONSymposium.com. That's MUFONSymposium.com. Go back, Lee Tepe. secret i love ponies i really love ponies i'm serious i couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush why fade to black because you never got that pony damn it this is fade to black with jimmy church on the game changer radio network and kgra the global radio alliance Welcome back, Fade to Black. Taking your calls, 323-825-5045. If you have any questions for Scott Walter, 323-825-5045. All right, let's go straight to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Say hi to Scott Walter. Who's calling? This is Christy. Hi, Christy. Hi, Christy. How are you? Hey, how are you, Scott? Finally great to talk to you. <laughs> well, we're having fun here. I saw your tweets, and um, I saw some of your comments. They make sense to me. I think so, because during that time period, he would have had to have had children, and I believe that these are symbols of family marks, and I think the Templars are trying to save them from the church to keep that bloodline going. I think you're right. I think, you, I think you're right. And that, that uh, if you read about the Templars, if you know anything about uh, some of their vows, their most important job was to protect uh, the bloodline, the physical bloodline. Yes, it, it uh, absolutely was. Well, for the audience, and, uh, well, Chrissy, let me jump in real quick, because for those that aren't on Twitter um, and haven't seen, uh, Chrissy posted a bunch of questions for me to ask. Uh, actually, about a dozen, Chrissy. Good job, by the way. <laughs> and, and so, uh, what she's referring to, uh, let me uh, let me jump down to some of your first comments because the audience doesn't know what you and uh, 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 Scott are talking about right now. Chrissy said during the uh, during Jesus' time, he would have had to have married or been stoned to death due to their com- communal needs. And then uh, she went on and followed up with, the Bible skips 20 years to hide his normal life. He would have had had several children. And then you posted again, back to back, it was the duty of the sons to take care of the parents, to have children, and to work for the village. And that's what Scott is referring to. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, the rules would have been even more strict as a rabbi. Um, he had to be married, and he had to have a son specifically. So, um, and and there are a number of different references. Um, you know, some are better than others, but based on everything I've heard, um, the numbers are the numbers that I've heard is that he had uh, as many as four children, which some people will be shocked by. But again, if you just look at it pragmatically and in context with the time he lived, as Chrissy has pointed out. That's pretty standard. Absolutely. And I think a lot of people need to see this. You know, it's not heresy. It's fact. 
And that's what you are so good about doing. It. You bring in the facts. You bring in the facts. You have us listen to it and think about it so that we can delve deeper into it. And this is a time of change. And you are making this more and more available to people. And people need to listen to this. Yeah, thank you yeah. for that, Chrissy. And here's here's your opportunity to ask Scott a question. Um, okay, I, what was the actual aha moment for you? Was it the Ken, Kensington Rune Zone or something else that made you decide to delve into this so deep? What made that one moment to where you knew you had to go into the deeper? Well, you know, it, it's, it's, it was the runestone, but it, it wasn't, um, you know, a discovery that I made or, or some epiphany thing that, you know, oh, my God, this is, this is the answer. It was really the criticism and the, what I felt was completely illogical response to the geological work I did on the runestone and the obvious conclusion that it was genuine. And all of a sudden, I, you know, I became a target. And... You have to remember back in, in 2000, I didn't know anything about, you know, sacred paradigms and, you know, this is the history and, and you know, uh, all this stuff that I, I just, I was shocked. I mean, it was like, really? <laughs> and, and the funny thing was the geologists, nobody was, the geologists all agreed with me. This was coming from people, academics in different disciplines, what I call opinion-driven disciplines, not hard science disciplines. And uh, I'm not trying to say that they're not uh, good disciplines or, or that these, these are bad people. It's just they do their business in a different way is what I eventually learned. And, you know, once once I got going on um, the rune stone and the language, the runes, the dialect, the grammar, I mean, the fact that it's real means, logic demands that somebody carved it, they came from some place, and they came there for some reason. All these things are absolutely uh, necessary. They they are true. Uh, finding the answers was the difficult part, and so that began this 15 year long journey. That you know um, we 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 hit a really big one here with um, the Hook X Tower and the Jesus Ossuary. I mean the trail led right to Jerusalem and to the Telpia tomb, and I've been working with these guys behind the scenes for about four years now, and then they brought me this hooked X. I mean, who would have thunk? <laughs> but it all started with the criticism, and it hasn't stopped. If anything, it's gotten worse. But as I said to you earlier today, Chrissy, I don't get upset by it because they don't have any evidence to refute it. It just inspires me. The nastier they get, the drives more. You more. The more yes. Oh, are you kidding? It game on. <laughs> well, see, that's kind of what I'm starting to go through now too, because I'm starting to state my opinions and what I'm finding as well. And I can't imagine what you go through being a public figure. And I think some of it might be money driven. It might be controversial for me to say this, but a lot of people make money off of their opinions when they write history books and when they do <laughs> seminars and when they teach classes. And this oh. will wipe all of that clean. They'll have to start over again and their opinion won't matter as much. And maybe well, I shouldn't say that because it is controversial, but Yeah. No, you're right, you're right, Chrissy. That's that's part of it. Uh, but there's more to it than that. And some of some of some people have suggested. I mean, you know, if you go back to the time of when we were founding this country and we were expanding and killing the natives, taking their land, and the whole myth of Columbus was it was part of the policy to basically justify. Hey, look, there was nobody here before Chris, so this is our sovereign right to take this land, which is ridiculous because. <laughs> Tens of millions of people already living here before Chris ever didn't set foot on the continent. I mean, it's insane, but, but it was part of the policy. And, and, and to be honest with you, I can actually understand why that was the government policy at the time. I don't agree with it, but I can understand it back then in context right. of that time. But, but why now? Why continue with the lies? Why is the Smithsonian Institute flat out lying to us about the Bat Creek Stone? I mean, they, because they screwed they, it up. Don't you think a lot of it is because they have so much against, you know, what Hitler did and everything and, and his camps. And essentially, my ancestors were annihilated. 
because I'm a Native American as well. And the thing yeah. is, they're still being put on little plots of land. They're supposed to stay on those. So it's still happening in essentially in some oh, ways. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So they well, would, they, they would yeah. have to completely go over all this. Everything would change. And they don't like that. They want to keep it the way it is because certain people are happy with what they have. And, and I'm glad that you're coming out with the truth. And I want to learn more, and I cannot wait to see what you find and if well, I can well, be any help I will be <laughs> no, I know you will I can tell but I, I will say this too and um, you know the, the Native American story is huge in this whole this whole thing and you know the one thing that I, I recognized a long time ago is that if there were you know if the Templars came here if anybody came here prior to Columbus who do you think would know about it well, gee, maybe the natives would. And so I reached out to various native tribes a long time ago. And quite frankly, because of what happened to the natives, and let's just call it what it was, genocide, um, it was. They, they don't care what white people think. They don't care about helping us answer these questions. In fact, they, many of them can't stand academics because... They resent the fact that Native Amer or that academics are trying to tell them what their history is, and and I mean, who would put up with that? I mean, it's, well, they tried to erase it by taking their children, changing yeah. their names, and then those children weren't even welcome in the white society. And then when they would try to go back right. to their people, they weren't accepted then either. So that even is part of. I mean, it, it gets so deep. But well, I I called, applaud called, you for what you're doing. Yeah, it's 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 a form of ethnic cleansing. I mean, they wouldn't let them speak their own languages, and and I mean, this happened. You know, this was going on right up in well into the 20th century. I mean, this isn't something that's way back in in colonial times. This this is this is well still going on in some places, it's, it's, and nobody talks about it. It needs to be talked about, but it's part of it's part of the whole story of getting our history correct. We have to address. The Native American problem, and uh, it's it's it is what it is. I mean, you know, you know it, I know it, and it needs to get out there. Thank you for the call, well, Chrissy. Thank you so much. Well, I, I was I was enjoying you. just kicking back and letting uh, Chrissy co-host the show. I was just like, wow, this is great. Oh, I'm, I'm just, so sorry. No, hey, hey, hey. <laughs> no, you did good, pal. Very good. I just shut up and just <laughs> sat back and smiled. Thank you so much, Chrissy. <laughs> well, you guys have a great evening. You too, Chrissy. Thanks, Chrissy. Thank you. Uh, you know, um, uh, I, I think it was yesterday, uh, Scott, talking about, you know, I, I hate to go here because there are some parts of our history that I'm not proud of. And yesterday uh, I was looking, uh, uh, researching for the show, and I always look at different things that happened on this day in history. And yesterday was the Oklahoma land grab. And, yeah. and, you know, and you go and I've read about it and, and of course we all know about it, but you go and you read it again as an adult and knowing what, I mean, how it was just like, literally Scott, they fired a gun in the air and said, go. And uh, everybody just, just took off and they grabbed all of the native American land that we had just claimed as yeah. our own and just gave it away. And it was done at, you know, uh, like a, a starter's pistol at the Olympics. And it, it, it's that how it was done, you know, and, and <laughs> isn't it, it, it oh, just, Oh man. And, and it, it bothered me so much that I didn't even want to talk about it. I didn't want to yeah. say, you know, this day in history was the Oklahoma land grab, uh, you know, with a starter's yeah. pistol. I mean, Oh man. So well, I mean, yeah, it's look, it's 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 a tough thing, but it is it's you know, uh, hey, a, a lot of these things are not pleasant to talk about, but you have to talk about them. I mean, the truth is the truth, and and um, you know what, I, I have to say though, I think people in this country and around the world are ready ready to clear out the BS and they want to know the real truth and <clears throat> whatever the reasons are why they were hiding it from us, I just don't think they're, they're, they're relevant anymore. And let's face it, the church was a big part of the cover up because they wanted to preserve their sacred story, what I call the myth of Jesus. And, and they did it for 2000 years. It was amazing run, but 
it's over now, and I, and I, I, I and, and the the good part is is that it shouldn't challenge anybody's faith. It shouldn't make people feel uncomfortable. I mean, anybody and everybody can have a relationship with their creator, whoever that might be. Um, you don't need a conduit to get there. That's when all the problems start. And the church doesn't want people to know that because then they become irrelevant. But people are figuring that out. Young people especially, they, they, are, they are very spiritual and they ask the same big questions that we all do, but they, they're not finding the answers in Orthodox religion. They're, they're finding it with their friends and, and uh, with family and like-minded people, and they're going back to the basic stuff you know, just treat people the way you want to be treated, do nice things, and, you know, life isn't that complicated sometimes. We, we make it tougher than it, than it is, I think. I want to ask you a couple... All right, I'm off my soapbox. Yeah, hey, 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 <laughs> we're going we're gonna to stay right on it. I want to ask you a, a, a couple of uh, crazy questions, a little, little off the wall, but what do you think about uh, Akhenaten's face, man? Do you think he looks like Obama? <laughs> Um, well, I, you know, I never thought about it like that, but, um, yeah, a little bit, I guess you could make that argument, but you have to remember, um, Akhenaten was the one who brought in monotheistic dualism, the, the, the heretic Pharaoh who brought in the new religion. And that's the religion that we're talking about. That's what the hook X represents. And the whole idea of dualism is the concept of opposites that keep things in balance, male, female, heaven and earth, good, bad, light, dark, yin, yang, all that stuff. But some people uh, have suggested, and I think they're probably right, that Akhenaten is depicted as an androgynous person. He's got male and female features. That's why his hips are a little wider, and he's got uh, what look like, you know, small breasts and sort of that, you know, look on the face that you're talking about. But I, I think that's just a reflection of the ideology that he embraced, that dualism, male, female, and, and that an androgynous look. Have you been to uh, Giza? I have not. That's one of the few places in the world I have not been, and um, it's on my list. It's on my bucket list, let me tell you. <laughs> well, when you look at, I haven't been there either, but uh, I, when you look at the, the sculpture work and the stone work that was done uh, you know, so many thousands and thousands of years ago. I mean, this is a long time ago. It's 5,000 years ago. At uh, least. A, at least. When you look yeah. at that stonework, as a guy that is a rock guy, when you look at that, how on, on, uh, how on earth were they able to create that kind of sculpture with copper chisels and stone hammers? How is that possible to do that kind of intricate work? Well, you know, I've read a lot of different things, and I, 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 I and, the, and the answer to the question is I don't know. I really don't know. But I think, I think sometimes people are a little quick to go to the alien card or some um, extraterrestrial intervention because we just aren't capable of doing that. Ancient humans weren't weren't capable, and and I don't think that's the case. Um, I think that we're underestimating the ancients and their ability uh, to do some amazing things. And, and quite frankly, I think a lot of that knowledge has been lost. But I think we're selling them a bit short if uh, we don't give them the credit for having the ability and the technology to do it. Uh, sorry, Scott. Um, actually, uh, I, that was a phone call that came in. That's why I muted. You heard me oh. say that. But the audience didn't. <laughs> oh well, great! Thanks for screwing me up. <laughs> uh, no, actually, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, I'll tell everybody that was uh, uh, Jason Martell calling in, and uh, I don't know. Maybe he meant to call the show, so I just said, "Jason, I'll, I'll call you back after the show." So, uh, speaking of ancient aliens and ancient alien theory, that was kind of weird. Maybe he was call He thought he was calling into the show. Ah, that'll be interesting, Jason. If you're listening. <laughs> The number is three two three eight two five five zero four five. Call in on uh, call in on the main line, and I'll bring you in right away. Maybe that's it. He knows I'm on the air, um, but I don't want to. I I don't necessarily jump to the ancient uh, alien theory when it comes to that sculpture as well. I don't, but I do 
jump to uh, uh, in, intelligence or technology that was handed down to them, pro- possibly from another culture. Uh, that uh, you know, because there's no way that uh, a copper chisel and a round stone uh, ball is going to carve the face of Akhenaten. There's, I, there's, there's just no way, and, and certainly chicken bones aren't going to pull that off either. So I don't. Well, wait, now, well, wait a minute. Now, I, again, I think you might be a little dismissive of these guys. Remember, we're talking about Egypt, and not too far south, we're talking about the largest diamond mines in the world. And you know, they, there was a lot of trade going on, and um, you know, and other very hard uh, stones that would be used for industrial purposes, like shaping very hard stones. And and so I. I I think that they're, you know, we got to give them a chance for being pretty sharp back in their day and having the technology and ability to get the resources they needed and the skill to do the things that seem impossible to us today. I'm, I'm not, I'm not ready to sell them short on that. Well, I, it, it, what about? Uh, do you think? Okay, let's just say it was that culture. Do you think they had another? Uh, a possible mechanical device? Where did the measuring come from uh, and the ability to make things symmetrical without complex geometry or the ability to bring in math? Uh, well, know, to- why, why, why wouldn't they have had math? I think they, they probably had very sophisticated math and geometry and trigonometry and everything else. So I, I, I think that's presumptuous to think that they didn't. I think they absolutely did. I think the structures we're looking at is the evidence that they did. I, I, I'm sure they did. Uh, okay. Well, then let's throw in, uh, let's throw in the, uh, the construction of the pyramids and the Great Pyramid in general. Again, you're a rock guy. To, to cut tw- two and a half million, 2.4 million stones in 20 years, you know, the, the, it, it's been said so many times, to, to quarry, cut, and place each stone they would have had to have done it, quarried it, and 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 placed it uh, and cut it every two and a half minutes. You're a rock guy. Where do you do you back up and just go impossible? Well, I, I how where did they come up with the twenty year thing? Uh, uh, because that is when Cheops was alive, and they would have had to have the pyramid you know, finish when he, when his reign ended. Well, do we know that for sure? No, we don't. That, but that's what, <laughs> but that's what Egypt, Egyptologists will say. Uh, let's well, ha- I can tell you this, the Egyptologists basically, uh, pooched it with the Sphinx and, uh, <laughs> Robert Schock, uh, turned the Egyptologists on their ear when he, um, geologically explained to my satisfaction that the Sphinx was much older, thousands of years older than the Egyptologists said, and they basically crucified him for it because he simply showed that they were wrong. And so, to be honest with you, I don't trust them all. I don't trust them all. I mean, they might be right about some things, but um, I guess I'd need to see their argument before I can comment on it. But could they have been wrong about these numbers? Hell yeah. <laughs> Right, and if that's the case, then maybe the pyramids were built 5,000 years before. Let's go back to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Who's calling? This is Beth from Minneapolis. Oh, from uh, Scott's hometowns. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I'm sorry. You're from Minneapolis. <laughs> where, where do you live? Yeah. Uh, I live in Bloomington. Oh, okay. You well, know? you're about 10 minutes away from my house. Oh, I actually sent you an email um, referencing Robert Temple quite a while ago. You probably don't okay. remember. Okay. I don't um, remember either. I, 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 I get a lot of emails. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> well, anyway, um, I try to look at this in a really big picture way, and um, I see this as the cult of Aten moving out of Egypt into the Holy Land, through Jesus's uh, family, and then if you look at, and I like to think of Jesus the way 
um, Thomas Jefferson did, where he cut out all the miracles in the Bible and just looked at him as a very good man. Um, so, anyway, it migrated to the Holy Land, and then with the, um, the Knights Templar across Europe and possibly to the, to the New World, as, you know, you've seen evidence. So, I think we're all really tied up in this very ancient religion, and there's something really, really amazing we have to learn about it. We, the, to me, this is all side issues. There's something that had to be very strong about it to keep it that forceful at, for that long uh, to survive that much time and that many miles. So I think there's something we need to somehow come to terms with. I think there's something yet to know, and I think it's really important, whatever it is. Yeah, thank you for that, well, Beth. Uh, did, yeah. did you have a question for Scott? Well, I just wonder, um, how, how do you how do you see the, the relationship between, you know, you, you definitely can tie in the, the, crook, the flail and the crook to the hook decks. I mean, do you see do you see the hooked X? Do you see this ancient religion as coming back, working its way into the new world, and, and someday we'll find the answer here? Thank you so much. Of yeah. course. Yeah, thank no, you. That's, she hit the, na- she hit, the, hit the nail on the head. I mean, this is an ancient belief system um, <laughs> of uh, monotheistic dualism. I mean, it's a, a, a single deity, um, and, you know, the people that um that has dualistic aspects and and it's about balance and you know this is really if you look at it this is the native way i mean the natives have lived in balance for tens of thousands of years and they believe in a single creator in a single deity and um they found a way to to you know to to live for a healthy lifestyle for a long time, and I think they've had it figured out the whole time. And it, and, and some people have suggested this goes back to a worldwide uh, belief system that um, over the years evolved differently, and it became patriarchal, and we've gone through this whole um, historical uh, <laughs> thing that we've gone through. But I think she might be right that it's all coming full circle now, and um, people are starting to realize that some of these uh, organized things are not working and maybe going back to the old ways and finding a way to live in balance is really the way to go. I think in a nutshell, that's, that's really what the message is. And that's, that's kind of what the research I've done is, is, is leading to. I, I, that's my conclusion at this point. Well, and, and, and geographically, I mean, how many miles is, let's just say Jerusalem, Jerusalem uh, from Cairo? I mean, they're neighbors. You have the Sinai Plains. Well, it's not far at all. No, I mean, it's not. It's like driving to Wisconsin for a Packer game, you know, or not even that far. Right. Why would you go to a Packer game anyway? Jeez, I don't know. Easy, <laughs> easy, easy. I'm a Colts guy. I'm a Colts guy. Let's not go there. Uh, uh, yeah, I can't say much. My bikes got pounded on Monday night, so yeah. I'm, I'm licking what? my wounds, man. What happened? We'll talk, we'll we talk got, about that. We got completely destroyed on every phase of the game. It was embarrassing. I went to bed in the third quarter. I just, I knew we had no chance. It was just, it was really demoralizing, I have to say. Uh, two words. You need Brett Favre. Brett. I'd lo- I, I'm a Favre guy. The only jersey I have is number four. I mean, he's a gamer, but you know what? It's over for him. And yeah. He yeah. ain't coming back. <laughs> you know, uh, Scott, it, it's just always amazing to have you on the show. I, uh, now, when does uh, uh, Pirates air? Is it Saturday night or is it Friday? Saturday at 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock Central. Two more episodes. And it's just going to heat up and get better from here. Uh, it's on history, and uh, it's going to be good. Wait, wait. So that's how it's going to run? So it's going to be two. Uh, you know what? We've got one more. Okay, let me squeeze in one more call. Let's go ahead and do this. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Who's calling? Say hi to Scott Walter. Hi, Scott. This is uh, Jim from New York. Hi, Jim from hey. New York. Hey, Jim. Hey, uh, i got a 
uh, run something by and see if it has any credence. Uh, I had an epiphany kind of uh, you know, a couple, few months ago concerning uh, the ancient, uh, you know, monuments and such and pyramids and like that, them being able to build them. And it's not so much on the cutting of the stones, it's the moving of them and all this uh it just I, I it's kind of I call it the support theory uh if you have thousands of people cutting stones and thousands of them trying to move them which seems impossible you're going to need thousands of people to hunt and gather food if that's all they're doing then now you need people building carts and to deliver the food if that if that's all they're doing is cutting trees to move the stones and then you need pe- another support group to gather food and water for them and then they need clothing and shelter now you need people to build huts for them and so forth and etc and add infinitum uh, excuse me it just it, it, it just even if they're slaves they're still humans they need food and water and clothing and it, it would take it just seems like it would take thousands of years to complete something like that you know yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I guess I can see it on one hand. You certainly, all those things you said make a lot of sense. And I think sometimes people forget about that when you see some amazing structure and even a building today that, that, that goes up, you forget about, it's not just the guys that are on the site, it's the people that designed it and the people that, you know, put together all the materials to make the concrete, to make the steel, to make the glass, to do all those things, to deliver it, to, I mean, it, there's there's a lot of moving parts. Is I guess the simplest way to put it, and it would be no different back then. But I guess on on the other hand, uh, you know, there it is. <laughs> it's it's it there, and, and, and it was made somehow. And but I I think it's a cop out, yeah. quite frankly, to to not give ancient cultures credit for for doing some amazing things. And until we we have evidence to the contrary. Um, we got it. We got it. They they figured it out somehow, and because there it is, you know. I mean, the. Well, the I, I figure they, they 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 were involved in it, but they had help. See what I'm saying? They they, they couldn't have well, done no, it Well, no, I understand modern. exactly what you're saying, but but I again, I think that there's a little bit of a cop out there until you you have no way of explaining it. Um, right. And and you really need evidence to support that. I mean, I know it's these are amazing structures and. They've got amazing technology and architecture and, and engineering and all that stuff, but um, to not give uh, the ancients some some credit, just because we don't know right. exactly how they did it doesn't mean they didn't do it. And and I, that's all I can really say, and, and I'm not saying you're wrong or anybody who says that they got help from other people or other beings. That's possible. I, I just... Uh, I haven't seen the evidence to go there yet. Thank you for the call, Jim. You okay. have a good night, man. You too. Bye. Thanks, Jim. You, you know, Scott, this is, but, it, but let, let's go back uh, uh, to your point about Robert Schock. Now, let's just suppose that uh, the Sphinx is uh, 8,000 years older than what they think it is, right? And let's, let's take that back to uh, the Ice Age, uh, 11,000 B.C., if that's the case, and then and we push the pyramids back, now we take that twenty-year problem off of the table that you were referring to, right? Okay, mm-hmm. so we take that yeah. twenty-year yeah. issue off, but now we're also dealing with a completely different culture. It wasn't. Oh, I just lost Scott. Scott, where'd you go? Oh no, 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 no. Okay, you know what? I'm going to take a. Take a quick break and let me pull Scott back up here. I'll do this in real time. And uh, this is Fade to Black. That was a complete dropout all the way around. This is Fade to Black. I'll bring Scott back right now. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Quick break. This is Fade to Black. I'll be back right after this. Stay with us. Viva 
Erica Fox here, and you are listening to my boy, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. Attention all fade or not, Studio Dome has a special deal on their SD1 Bluetooth speaker. Just go to JimmyChurchRadio.com, click on their banner, enter the promo code Jimmy, and you get $40 off and free shipping on the SD-1. It's voice activated. Comes with a USB antenna, cables, and a carry bag. Never listen to your phone, tablet, or laptop speakers ever again. It's the only way to listen to Fade to Black. That's JimmyChurchRadio.com, Studio Dome banner, promo code Jimmy, go back Lee Tepe. <laughs> It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com Hey everybody, what's up? Jimmy Church of Fade to Black and check this out. The 2015 MUFON Symposium will be held this September 24th through the 27th in beautiful downtown Irvine, California. Expanding ufology, opening new doors in academia, industry and media, Former Defense Minister of Canada Paul Hellyer will be there in person. Former CNN news anchor Cheryl Jones, TV news journalist Jaime Moussan, and MUFON's chief photo analyst Mark D'Antonio. They're just a few of the growing list of names for the 2015 event. It's September 24th through the 27th at the beautiful Hotel Irvine. Get your tickets today at MUFONSymposium.com. That's MUFONSymposium.com. Go back, Lee Tappy. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. All right, everybody, welcome back. Fade to black. Tonight, Scott Walter is with us. He's back with us. And uh, hey, Scott, uh, right before the break, uh, Jason Martell had called, right? Scott, are you there? Oh, I lost Scott again. We've got problems. And I want everybody to know, I just got off the phone with Jason. And uh, yeah, they're... uh, They got the animals together, they packed the car, and they're heading away from the coast. The tsunami warning is all over uh, the coast of California right now. Hey, Scott, are you back? I'm back. Yeah, uh, I just got off the phone with Jason, and he wanted to let me know that uh, that they've packed up the car, they've got the animals together, and uh, they've just left uh, the beach uh, that the tsunami warning is is uh, is going off on the coast uh, down in Southern California. And I was what? like, "You're kidding me!" And he goes, "Yeah, man, seriously? Yeah, yeah." I just got off the phone with him, so I'm going to call him back right after this. But uh, he's he- wow, yeah, they're heading inland. Wow, and I, so so the, there's a, there was an earthquake off the coast. It was uh, down in uh, Chile. It was an eight point three. And, oh, my God. Yeah, and I'm looking here. Here's a tsunami advisory that just went around California 36 minutes ago. National Tsunami Warning Center, the tsunami advisory remains in effect for the coastal areas of California from San Onofre State Beach uh, to Ragged Point, California. Uh, there you go. Wow, man. Well, that's crazy. Well, um, so are we done then? Uh, well, no, we're not done. You know what? You know what else is crazy, uh, Scott? Have you been uh, uh, watching this? Uh, you know, September twenty third and twenty fourth uh, asteroid hitting the Earth thing. Look, I don't subscribe to it, but it is all over the internet. And uh, have you been watching that? No. Yeah. No, I haven't. Yeah, it's, it's it's pretty bizarre, and they've tied everything into not only some biblical stuff and dating. Uh, but the Pope is going to be here on the 23rd. And, and, oh, and, and, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and so, well, you know, and next week uh, I host Coast to Coast, right, on Friday night, the 25th. So, uh, you know, hopefully uh, the show will go on, you know. <laughs> well, I hope so, too, it's, for uh, all too of fun. our sake. Too funny. 
But uh, so back to uh, the point that I was making before the call dropped was, yeah, I'm not taking anything away from um, uh, ancient civilizations or uh, dynastic Egypt or even pre-dynastic Egypt. Let's, I'm giving credit to a, a much older civilization. And, you know, we have to look at what Gobekli Tepe represents, you know, at 12, you know, 10,000 B.C., 11,000 B.C., um, it's a megalithic site that should not have existed. And it's 7,000 years older than the Great Pyramid. So certainly there was uh, the technology there to quarry, to farm, uh, to have uh, some sort of uh, city, you know, there to quarry and make Gobekli Tepe exist today. So, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, I, I'm ab- absolutely giving credit to another civilization uh, that was uh, much older than than Egypt. I think this is me, but I think the pharaohs and dynastic Egypt, uh, when Upper and Lower Egypt uh, came together, they just inherited what was already there. They, it, the, the pyramids were already there. They well, already- that that's that makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, that's possible, but I, I don't know why it is, but it just seems like people are really quick to. Uh, well, it had to be aliens, and I'm like, oh, well, wait a minute. <laughs> I know it doesn't. <laughs> I don't know. It just it just seems like people I, I just – that's the fallback plan. It just seems a little too convenient for me. Well, you know, uh, sometimes it's it's things like that that are actually that, – that make the most sense. You know, the, the only problem that I have uh, with – uh, Gobekli Tepe and uh, and and Giza and also uh, some of the sites down in Bolivia and Peru and so <laughs> forth is when you go with the orthodox uh, views on history with all of that. With the problem is is that you are saying that certain societies had crazy advanced knowledge and math and were able to do crazy things while the rest of the world very small percentage of people in Giza had the ability to do it, but the rest of the world was running around wearing animal skins and were Stone Age man. And but uh, but yet the people at Giza. Yeah, but is that really true? I mean, I, I think that that they, might be they, uh, uh, but, but a presumption they, as well. But they but that's what they want us to believe. I'm oh, not making oh, oh, gotcha, that up. gotcha. No, no, no. I mean, look, there's pyramids and and megalithic structures that are being found all over the world that 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 date back farther like go get go get go, Tepe. i mean I, I don't know if i'm pronouncing that right go but, beckley uh, go beckley Tepe. oh beckley Tepe, yes there uh, go. but but i mean i mean look at stonehenge now they just found just under the surface three feet under the surface there's a giant mega stonehenge uh, uh, in you know uh, right there at Stonehenge, that that dwarfs the thing that we all thought was so fantastic. So, and it's 1500- I, I really think we're just peeling back the the first layer of the historical onion that's going to reveal some pretty amazing things. Yeah, absolutely. And this new Superhenge is fifteen hundred years older than Stonehenge. Yeah, yeah. that uh, you're absolutely right. That throws a well. Whole that new might in fifteen hundred may not be right. It may be older than that. You know. Yeah, and, well, and and again, you know, when you you you've been to Stonehenge and you look at those, and when you're a rock guy, and I keep saying that, but that's what you are. I'm not a rock guy, and you look at it doesn't that, offend me at all. I and, call myself a rockhead all the time. There you go, there you go. And when so when you look at that, and you think about how those were transported, it's not. I have to look at uh, modern technology today. We would never, ever, 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 ever build that. It's too hard. It's too crazy. We're not going to, uh, uh, you know, try to transport uh, fifty hundred ton rocks. We we just wouldn't, and we don't really have the ability to do it. We couldn't do it, and we wouldn't do it. So how did they? That's all. How did they? Yeah. How did they do it? You know, was Merlin there levitating them with some crazy <laughs> magic staff? I don't know. But how did they do it? That's all that I'm saying. So, uh, uh, no, I, I I hear you, man. But I, you know what? Someday when we do figure it out, and I think we probably will, it's going to be one of those moments where we're going to go, well, duh, and it'll probably be a lot 
lot easier um, technologically than we ever thought. I, I just I just think that'll be the case. I, I do. Well, let's hope so, and we can all just you know stop the infighting and the bickering and and, and get to the <laughs> bottom of it. But I had uh, I I had read the other day. I went and did some research. And I could be wrong, you know, the internet isn't 100% right, but I went and looked at the biggest cranes in the world and what they could support, okay? The biggest today, the most gnarliest thing that you can picture in your mind. You ready for this, Scott? Mm Mm-hmm. 50 tons at 100 feet. The most gnarliest crane on planet Earth. 50 tons, 100 feet. Now, the granite, the red granite that is in the king's chamber, now mm-hmm. you're looking at 70 to 100 tons at 200 feet. Mm. Now, just just think about that for a second. Just just wrap yeah. your mind around that. And that is the extreme uh, cases of the biggest and best that we have on planet Earth. 50 tons, 100 feet. Okay, not two hundred feet up in the air. Okay, it's 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 a hundred feet, and 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 fifty times. Ton- that's it. That's it. That's the most extreme. So let's uh, you know you have to stop and think for a second. What? How did they get it done? That's all I want to know. I just want to know how yeah. they got it done. It's not. It's not. A, it's not manpower. It's not a thousand slaves wrapped around one of these hundred ton megalithic blocks. You can't get that many hands on it. And rolling that kind of weight over. And what about a boat? What kind of boat did they build to go up the Nile from Aswan to get up the Nile? Where you know they, that's five hundred miles away. Those granite blocks came from five hundred miles away, and those blocks in the king's chamber are no joke. They're no joke. Yeah. You know, fifty, seventy, a hundred tons. And and they went 500 miles. I just want answers. But they didn't put it on some barge, and they floated it up. The, what kind of ship did they have at 3500 B.C. to pull that off? Somebody explain it to me, and I'm cool. But until then, there was something else that got it done, and it must have been another culture that we don't know about. But it wasn't the culture at 3500 B.C., unless E.T. was here. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Hey Scott, you have well. A- I, I if I had the answer and I could argue with you, I I would do it. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I just say don't sell humans short. That's all. I never we, will. We we you know the the ancients were uh, amazing. That's all I can say. I, I they they found a way. I just have this gut feeling they found a way. Thank you so much, Scott. I, always <laughs> a great. Did you have good chicken tonight? Was it all good? Oh, my God. My wife makes the best baked chicken on the planet. I, I go and I play basketball, I work out, and then I come home, and it's just awesome. So It's, it, it, it's, it's wonderful, isn't it? I have the she same She did a great sit- job. She I always have, does. I have the same By sit- the way, real, real quick before we go, you know, my wife has a book coming out um, in about a month and a half. Really? What's it about? Yeah. It's called America, Nation of the Goddess. And it's uh, it's really really good. They are going to reveal some secrets about our nation that people had no idea. It's really good. Are you telling me I'm going to have Janet Walter on my show? Is that what you're uh, telling me? I, I look. You've had enough of me. It's time to get the the brains of the outfit on the show. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, oh, I'm man. serious. Yeah, I'm not let's joking. do this. Let's. Uh, we'll find out where uh, Scott, you know, gets his bread buttered. That's all I want to know. You know, thank you <laughs> well, so you much. Well, you can talk to her. She's a hell of a lot. She's, she's smarter than me. She's better looking. Um, trust me, she'll be a great guest. All the best, Scott. Give my best to Janet. Thank you so much. And I look forward. Send me the information on the book, and we'll get it out there. All right. Sounds good, Jim. Hey, thanks for having me on. Fun as always. Always, Scott. Thank you so much, brother. All right. Take care, man. Scott Walter, everybody. And uh, thank you so much. Great conversation tonight. And he's, he, he, see, see, I can't get Scott to go there because he's just a little bit too, uh, like he should be, he's too pragmatic. And, and, and I think that's great. That's one of the things that I love about Scott. Scott, thank you so much. And uh, now I will say this, everybody, uh, we've got the tsunami warning going off. I get a phone call like that um, uh, from a friend and he sounded alarmed. And so I don't know what's going on on the coast. 
Uh, but uh, for for that to go down, something is happening here. And I hope that uh, uh, everybody is uh, safe here in Southern California and certainly down in Chile. I, I don't know. Wow, that just uh, freaked me out uh, for that phone call to come in. So, uh, Jason, if you're listening, uh, I'll be right back in touch. But I want everybody to be safe. We have so many friends that live down there and live on the coast. Uh, wow, wow. 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 Um, okay. Uh, there you go. I've got uh, a few things that I want to get back to and, uh, and let's see, where are we? Let me wrap up with this. Um, by the way, if anybody is listening right now, uh, in Southern California, down on the coast, uh, let us know. We've got a few minutes. You can call into the show really quick. Three, two, two, three, two, three, eight, two, five, 50, 45. And let us know what's going on uh, down there. I'm watching. Uh, wow, man, I've got email coming in now, too. Ooh, man, what is going on? All right. The scientific case for the health benefits of cocoa is so strong that some experts are now calling for the development of a supplement, a chocolate pill, a chocolate pill that will promote brain health and in particular prevent age-related disorders such as Alzheimer's. Research now suggests that the chemicals in cocoa may help protect against cancer. Other studies have linked cocoa to improved cardiovascular health, lower blood pressure, and an improved blood flow, blood, blood flow, Blood flow to the brain. A cocoa pill. Hey, Rita, that dark chocolate back at the house, get it unwrapped because we might be able to stop uh, stop my lack of memory, my degradation. But uh, I think we all knew we all knew that 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 dark chocolate. That 90, 88% cacao, you know what I'm talking about? The really good stuff was actually healthy. I knew it. You can taste it. So there you go. Janice Joplin's wildly crazy, crazily painted uh, Porsche. It's a 1965 Porsche 356C Cabriolet is going to be auctioned. It's going to be auctioned uh, in, a, in about two months. December 10th by RM Sotheby's in New York. And I think I think Rita's got a little story about that car. Rita. Oh, I can't say anything. Did I just do that? I didn't. I didn't. I didn't. I'll take it all back. The car has been featured at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and Museum in Cleveland for the past two decades. It's being sold by the Joplin family, and it's expected to bring... About $400,000, Janice Joplin's car, up for auction. Officials at Waterton Canyon in Denver, uh, over the last couple of weeks, these selfies with the bears, right? They're all over the internet. I think there's actually a couple of selfie groups. You can actually uh, find stuff on Twitter, hashtag bear selfie or whatever. And it's become such a problem now that people are going up to these bears. They got their selfie sticks. And the challenge is to get as close to these bears as you can. But the, the doofus part, the stupid part is you're turning your back to a bear. And why would anybody do that? Now, they, they all of these bears... Uh, are lining up next to the road. These people park their cars. They jump out of the car. They run up to the bear. They pull out the selfie stick, and they're trying to take a selfie. It's out of control. So now they've shut it down. The rampant bear selfie problem is uh, has resolved itself. They've closed Waterton Canyon in Denver. The, the amount of tourists that turn their backs to feeding bears, foraging bears, while I I can't think of another way to put it. They're lining themselves up for the perfect shot, and uh, it's, it's out of control. 
And I don't even know what is going through somebody's mind that that they think that that is a good thing to do. The good news is there haven't been any deaths. Allegedly. In the realm of Avion Research, I'll leave you with this. Oh, man, who did this? Brandon. Lisa just uh, tweeted out pictures of Janis Joplin's uh, Porsche. I'm going to retweet these. Those are good pics. There you go. All right, I got them out. Yeah, look at that car. Is that insane? 400 grand seems cheap. Just seems cheap. That's a, I, I would drive that. I'd drive that around. Okay. Now, this seems a little hard to believe, but uh, you need to just check this out. In the realm of Avion Research, the chicks with glow-in-the-dark beaks and feet, listen to this, may one day enter the poultry world. British science, glow-in-the-dark. Listen. British scientists say they have genetically modified chickens in a bid to block bird flu that in early experiments show promise for fighting off the disease that has devastated the U.S. poultry and egg industries. Their research, which has been backed by the uh, United Kingdom government and top chicken companies, will potentially prevent repeats of this year's wipeout. That's right. 48 million chickens and turkeys were killed because of the disease since December in the United States alone. But the promising chickens that have been genetically modified were injected with a fluorescent protein to distinguish them from normal birds in experiments. Yes, the birds that were GMO'd and modified glow in the dark. Their beaks and their feet glow. Health regulators around the world have yet to approve any animals bred as GMOs, but right now we've gotten rid of the bird flu. But it's GMO. And are we cool with a GMO chicken in the markets? And possibly glow in the dark. FBI agents here in California are investigating the cutting of two more AT&T fiber optic cables earlier this week. This is at least the 11th such attack this year. AT&T is now offering a $250,000 reward for information. And this is where it gets crazy. The most recent attack, which took place in the town of Livermore, Everybody knows Livermore up in San Francisco involved the cutting of cables in two different manholes at about 10.30 p.m. this past Monday. Now, they suspect that these guys are disguised as utility workers because nobody has seen any action going on, anything suspicious. But at 10.30 p.m., they were able to pop a couple of, at the same time, a couple of manhole covers and get into the vault that is underneath the ground. The fiber optic cable itself is encased in metal. So they have cut the metal and then, this is how they're suggesting this has gone down, they cut the metal first, then go inside, and then cut the fiber optics. Now there's some issues with AT&T. It may be a, a bunch of disgruntled employees. Of, of that it's a team effort. How do you get a manhole cover up? How do you get in there? How do you get it done? And how do you replace a manhole cover? And then how do you get, get away? They know when and where these fiber optic cables are cut, but they haven't been able to catch anybody. It's absolutely insane. Or some suspect now, and this is what's floating around, it just may be terrorists. That they're trying to figure out how quickly we can get our infrastructure back up and in place and running. It's interesting. 11th, twice in one day. This is Fade to Black. Thank you, Scott Walter. Gonna have Janet on soon. Thank you, Scott. Great conversation tonight. 
Fade to Black's executive producers, Rita Kamarian. Shows produced by Hilton J. Paul, Mark D. Kovar, LJ3, Renee, Mark Dunbar, and Jonas. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Bateau, and Mark D. Kovar. Fady by Dale. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldridge. Intro, Spaceboy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. Syndication is KGRA The Planet. Tomorrow night, Fader Night with a little rock and roll trivia thrown in. This broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2015 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow us on Twitter at J Church Radio. Be safe. Go Beckley Tepe. Yeah, yeah, yeah.